How y'all doing, everyone? Happy Friday, and welcome to The WAN Show. We've got a great show lined up for you guys today. We are well into Techtober. We got pixels to talk about. We got ARC GPUs to talk about. We got 4090 GPUs to talk about. We got 13th gen. Wait, no. No, we're not talking about 13th gen. Not, uh, that, that's still, that's oh, still under NDA. Oh, hold, hold on. But there's yeah. lots more coming. What else we got? Yeah, uh, I took all the good ones. Got them. <laughs> I think you took everything. No, uh, no, no. YouTube uh, test putting 4K behind a paywall. I have the hottest take. Uh, you do, actually. I actually have and the hottest take. And I am take. here for it this time. I got your back. Uh, also, there was a Made by Google event, uh, which show, uh, broadcasted all of the most boring things you could possibly imagine. Oh, come but on. But we will make it interesting. Oh, come Just on. like we always do. Hit it, Chewy. <laughs> I'm Chewy. I got him. <laughs> Punch it. Darn it. Yeah, you were close. I know. He, he, he doesn't Star Wars. <laughs> he thinks he Star Wars. Is. <laughs> He's a wannabe Star Warser. That's uh, this, so sad. The show is brought to you by Zoho One, Savage Jerky, and Squarespace. And I guess we're going to have to jump right into the big topic. Now, Yeah. I'm not going to break down the extremely long and detailed argument that I have for my position here. Oh, we're going into it. Because it's going to be a separate video. I recorded it today. Hopefully it'll go up early next week. But the word... Oh, not the word on the street. YouTube has tested putting 4K behind a YouTube premium paywall. So essentially making access to the 4K resolution. I mean, it's not really a drop down because it pops up. Uh, jump up. The, the car, jump, the car cog, sure. selector, whatever. YouTube has made access to the 4K quality selection in the cog in the player. Um, a premium exclusive feature, along with other premium features like background playback, the removal of ads, uh, bundling with YouTube music, and such things. This is um, an unexpected course change if you don't really, if you weren't really ready for it, I think. I mean, considering that YouTube has over time done nothing but add higher resolution, higher quality media support, 360 video, to their paid tier, 8K, HDR, they have never actually hidden or or blocked off or paywalled the highest quality experience. Uh, subtitles, um, no matter what it is, yep. it's always been available to everyone they introduced 4k in 2010 they did 8k in 2015 which given the technical challenges around 8k seven in 2015. years ago yeah was kind of wild honestly i am surprised that more people didn't cause problems for them with it because you don't need an 8k camera to export yeah. an 8k video and take advantage of that extra bit rate i'm surprised that more people didn't take advantage of it. high refresh rate is another thing that youtube has added for all users a lot of this all came at a pretty similar time it felt like there was almost a uh, video technology kick that youtube was on Around when they launched, they launched 8K, they launched 360 video, they launched VR support, which is kind of similar to 360 video, but it's not exactly the same. They, they launched all this other type of stuff. They did all of it at a very similar time, and they've continued pushing for it, but not yeah. quite as hard as they did in the past. Yeah, but here it is. Confirmed, witnessed, out in the real world. 2160p resolution, premium feature, look at that. Premium, tap to, tap upgrade. to upgrade, right there. Uh, what else can we say about it? Uh, excuse me. Um, and this is not just one post. So there have been multiple posts on Reddit. Uh, and this is coming right on the heels of the extra unskippable ads controversy. Just last month, which was as little as eight days ago, uh, some users <laughs> were experiencing up to 10 unskippable ads in a row. Uh, YouTube said this was a small experiment. Uh, every Everything that I heard about it was off the record. So I, I can't quote anybody or anything or whatever. I can't tell you how I know any of this. But um, 
What I will say is that Google is a very engineering focused company and engineering, a scientific approach requires testing, te experimentation yep. and evaluation of results. And what I will say is that before you assume that YouTube is just a bunch of dunderheads, um, they, everyone that I did or didn't speak to, who knows, allegedly, um, knew that that was an extremely bad idea and that it was not necessary to test that. <laughs> uh, just, so, just so you guys know, I mean, it's not that I think YouTube does everything right by any stretch of the imagination, <laughs> but that I think was not, uh, I think that was more of like a policy problem than an actual, we think this is a good idea. I think it's one um, of those situations people where problem. Uh, like a bunch of people probably really were, 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 were very certain that something wouldn't work. And then someone finally was like, no, we have to test it. They tested it and it worked really well. Or they like just differing from the expected result. Right. And then the, the person who was right was like, no, now we have to test everything. Blah, 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 blah. YouTube has been quoted saying the goal of that experiment was to see if it was a better experience for viewers to reduce the number of ad breaks. Yeah. While of course still getting all, all of that, yeah, still getting yeah. all the ad revenue. And it, I no, the answer was no. That was not a better experience. Um, Which is honestly, I could kind of see it being a better experience sometimes. Yeah, I I could especially see, for music. Yeah, yeah, I could see that having a longer a longer uninterrupted. Like if you wanted to, period. I've never actually done this, but I know people do. If you wanted to watch like a concert, sure. Having that get interrupted by an ad break would be really weird. Yeah, that'd be really disruptive. Yeah. Yep, yep, I can see that. Making matters even more challenging for web users who are not super into paying for premium and not super into ads. Chrome will be making it more difficult to use ad blocking extensions to rectify any of these problems for yourself. Manifest V3 is the new extension platform for Chrome, and they may start turning off support for V2 as early as January 2023. That's like three months. Three and a half months. Oh, yeah. Most modern ad blockers rely on Chrome's web request API to block categories of HTTP requests, but they Manifest sure V3 requires devs to use a declarative, declarative net request, which forces them to use a block list of specific URLs, and that list of rules is limited to 30,000 entries. Many ad blocking lists can exceed 300 thousand entries to give you guys some idea malvertising so, providers are rejoicing at this um i think yeah i think that's something a lot of people have misunderstood about our previous discussions around ad block I, I think that there are a lot of people who um saw us make a video about pie hole and then saw me discuss the impact of ad blocking on online content creators and saw hypocrisy there but actually, there's no there's no hypocrisy there. The, there is an impact, and technology like Pi-hole does exist and does have valid uses. Uh, there there's absolutely malicious advertising yep. online, there, or rather, not necessarily even advertising at that point. It's just malware, but it uses many of the they, same they delivery sneak mechanisms. Through, yeah, they sneak exactly. through advertising platforms. Yeah. Um, and so this is. It's interesting. You block origin, I yeah. think, but I don't remember. Uh, said that yeah. they they believe strongly that they're going to be able to make it work. Um, but I mean, I'm they have kind to of, say that. Yeah. What else do. would they say? Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. We will. We have no idea. Nope. We're going to toss yeah. in the towel. Yeah. I uh, I I'm hoping that it's a bit of a resurgence for Firefox. That's my. Yeah, That's you're, so, you're a Firefox fanboy. I always forget about that. Yeah, I try to. I I often end up not really being able to use it because uh, I I because it hasn't been very good in a long time. And I have a pretty strong stance of yeah. If I'm using this thing for work, it has to be the best thing, even if I don't like it. Yeah. And like having interruptions in my work because my browser is having issues when I could just use Chrome is like unacceptable. So I've been on Chrome for a while because every time yeah. I've tried Firefox, I've had issues. But I know you're not happy about it. But I'm not happy about it. And I'm I'm going like to he's try. He's a nightly boy, you know? Yeah. I used mm. to love that. Yeah. I know. I know. And I deal with the problems when it was personal stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So I'm going to try again, probably in January. Um, Firefox. Here See me how it out. goes. Safari. 
Oh. <laughs> People were talking about it in the chat. I'm like, sure, I'll pitch it for you. I'll pitch it. <laughs> See how it goes. Now, um, aside from the ad blocking conversation, let's jump mm -hmm. back to 4K for yeah. a second. One of our discussion questions here is should 4K be a premium perk? And it says here most people don't even need it. I think that's a deeper, longer conversation. That's going to happen in the yes, dedicated that'll be in video. The video yeah. But I want to have a separate conversation about Floatplane. Our video platform, floatplane.com. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Officially trailblazers. Um, our video platform actually charges extra, not just yes. a little bit. It's It works out to, for the platform, more than double for 4K. And the, the way that that works, it's actually from five to $10, which is double. But the way that that works out is that at the lower transaction well, no. amount, it's more of it gets eaten up by credit card processing fees and stuff. So Hold on. The oh. five to ten dollar jump is your pricing. Yeah, so you, you're just talking about the platform. Oh, sorry. Yes. So, yes. So the way that it ends up working on the Linus Tech Tips page that is on the platform is, is a five to ten dollar jump. Yes. Um, it's different. Oh, okay. So anyway, the point is for you, the end user, because because creators can set their own pricing. But anyways, yeah, it's yeah. double. But the way that it actually works out is that it is it is is more than double. And the reason for that is that the additional cost of serving 4K is a lot more than I think people necessarily realize. And um, like bandwidth is hyper expensive and also very difficult. So I, let's talk a little bit about that because I had, I, I tweeted about sort of my hot take about this whole thing that I think YouTube is actually not only maybe justified in doing this, but that it also could be the right move for the platform in general, uh, like for the entire ecosystem. So I, I tweeted about this hot take and I had some people who I feel like have maybe a um maybe not the maybe not the full picture of of how this works cuz like to be clear I understand being upset about it like obviously yeah. I I hate when you tell me I you know have something and you take it away like I'm always reminded of that scene from Empire Strikes Back I'm altering the deal oh pray I don't alter it any further right yeah. like that's that's so that's so iconic because we're in this position where whether yeah. you're an individual end user, whether you are a creator, where Google holds all the power. If they decided tomorrow that not only was uh, did they not feel like serving 4K video to you know non-paying customers anymore, but they were going to remove it from the platform outright. And oh, by the way, that you know semi-archive of content that you've uploaded over the last 12 years. Uh, we're just gonna, we're gonna get rid of all the high quality copies of everything, we're gonna prune it all. They could decide that tomorrow on, on, a, on a whim. They could, and, and we're utterly powerless. And that's frustrating, and, and that sucks. Um, where was I going with this? I don't remember. Right, but I, but right, so I, so I, but I, but so I, so I made that anyway. I made that argument that right, but it could actually be the best thing, and you'll have to, you'll have to hear me out. Really, please hear me out. Um, but one of the some of the responses that I got from people who who were upset about it, I feel like we need to kind of talk about those things. So one person that I went back and forth with had said, well, you know, they, what, what do you mean bandwidth costs? Right? They laid that coax cable 30 years ago. Oh, that's not how that works. Right? Okay, so explain how that works okay, for the so people. Google doesn't own all of the uh, you know, cables that go around the entire internet. All the also all that stuff takes maintenance and whatnot. So like if Google wants to send you data, it's gonna have to go over ISPs lines and stuff like that. They have to you have to pay for bandwidth at some point. Google did spin up their own ISP. Uh, in the states, which probably gives them some some uh, cool abilities to do different things, they're on a certain scale that I don't fully understand. Like once you have date your own data centers and stuff, like I know OVH has their own dark fiber lines running all over the place and all this neat things. Like that stuff is beyond my scale of understanding. Sure. But bandwidth is highly expensive, and you have to deal with a lot of other 
entities. Like, I was going to say us, people, but Talk entities. about some of the other entities that we've had to deal with in order to maintain quality of service for users. Uh, one of the problems that we have right now, I'm going to call out a, a country specifically that we're actually having problems with. So sorry if you're having this problem. But in Germany, uh, there's yeah. multiple ISPs, right? Sure. And the, the pathways that we're using work great for some users in Germany, and it works really poorly for other users in Germany. We have really good service in Germany. Right. We also have not really good service in Germany. Right. It's not a cut and dry thing. And when you get on this scale, like there's stories that I actually talked about on Wayne Show in the past of, of Netflix back in the day, installing these red box Netflix servers in ISPs like data centers and in ISPs nodes and stuff because such a huge percentage of internet usage in these areas was all Netflix and they were actually helping the ISPs by doing this. Like the ISPs wanted these things installed uh, because it was getting it closer to the users. It was using less of the ISPs available bandwidth. It was helping them in general. Um, now you think about the usage of YouTube and all of the rest of Google stuff um, and it gets very complicated and very expensive. And the impossibility of trying to cache any, any, I mean, you could take, you just scatter shot it, right? Yeah. You could just hope that you've got something cached close to the, to the, to the end user. But like, yeah. I, I, that, that, that's a, <laughs> just dice rolls, right? At yeah. that point, pretty yeah, much. And like really advanced caching systems are great and stuff like that. But like, it's all highly complicated, highly difficult and very highly expensive. Um, and there was also uh, like like I I feel like um, uh, this perception right that once the once those lines though are laid that they're the ongoing cost is 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 negligible or or very low and the, this this individual pointed out that well you know that those coax lines keep getting faster and there's no additional cost but it's actually the the, the getting faster even though you might be running over the same pieces of copper or even the same pieces of fiber, the way they get faster is through ongoing maintenance yeah. and network and upgrades and R and D and everything else that continually get more and more and more and more expensive because the bottom line is that Moore's law might not be dead, but, uh, Moore is a little bit more difficult to keep up with. Dr. Moore is struggling a little bit, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it's not, Moore's law is not keeping up the way that it has. And even if you were to compare to something like electrical or water infrastructure, for example, just because those pipes are in the ground, that doesn't mean that they stop needing maintenance. That doesn't mean, you know, you don't still have to make sure there's clean water going through them. You know what I mean? Um, Infrastructure that that exists must be maintained and upgraded. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's tons of costs to it, um, and and something that you go over in the video as well. But like, there's I'm seeing comments about it. I'm seeing notes about all this kind of stuff. Like, oh, we shouldn't feel bad for billion dollar companies. I'm the first person to jump on that train, and I don't feel bad for them. No, why would I all. feel bad for them? Uh, none of this is feeling bad for them. A lot of this is understanding. Um, and not understanding me like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. No, it's it's the classic thing of a web company that is valued purely on scale. And then when scaling becomes difficult or your costs start ramping to a certain degree, you need to start making money. And yep. often how they start doing that is ugly. Um, and when he says need to start making money, I don't think either Luke or I would make the argument that Google does not make enough no, money. No, 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 no. But they do need to make money because if they don't make money on a given project, they're going to do Google things <laughs> and they're going to shut it down. <laughs> yeah. So. So, yeah, it's they're, they're going to make it make more money. Um, and 4k is really expensive, like we've already talked about. Yeah. Um, and they have done actually a lot of research figuring out that almost no one actually cares, um, which is an un potentially an uncomfortable thing to hear. Uh, it's something that Floatplane ran into, 
Um, we we had a bunch of conversations with users and with creators. Yeah. Um, one of the original ideas of Floatplane was like, hey, we're going to offer better quality everything, and that's going to be a huge selling point to the platform. People are going to want to join because their content will have never looked or sounded as good online, um, and users are going to want to subscribe because they can see their creator's content in, in higher quality, and they can hear it in higher quality. Which and makes then a big difference. We Man, tried audio to, matters. Oh, it super does. Um, your, your video can look as good as you want. If your audio sucks, no one's going to watch it. Did anyone um, care ever? Like even once? Nope. We have actually... That's not true. We have one person who cares. Garbage time. Garbage time. Garbage time cares that it sounds good. And that's great. <laughs> that's awesome. I love and appreciate that because boy howdy did we put some work into it and it really didn't pay off. <laughs> hey, it is now. It is, yeah. It well, is. It is now. Um, I mean, from like a purely like dollars and cents standpoint, yeah, no, not I so don't much. think it's paying off, but nope. it's, but at least we get to feel warm and fuzzy about it. Yeah. We've stuck to our guns. It still looks and sounds good. Um, and, and there's people in each other who are like, oh, I care. And you know what? You might, you might be, if I remember correctly from the video, uh, that I am probably going to misquote. So I'm sorry. You might be the, what was it? 1.5% of people <laughs> who actually care. It's such a tiny percentage of people youtube ran some experiments where they started just changing people's settings and they would set them to way lower yeah like 480 i think yeah people yeah, yeah, that yeah, were yeah. running at 4k they changed it to 480 and it was like so i'm gonna misquote the percentage i'm sorry i don't remember i think it was like 1.5 percent of people actually changed it back so you wonder you wonder why the uh, there's no persistent default video quality anymore and why they default to such a low video quality. It's because you are a discerning individual and notice the difference. And I can certainly tell the difference. Like, I, I get it. I'm with you. But my aunt, there is no way. My sister, love her to pieces. Bless her heart. She wouldn't be able to tell a 480p YouTube video from a 1080p YouTube video. Maybe not even from a 4K YouTube video. She's just, not, it, she doesn't care. It doesn't matter. I'm her. actually, I'm actually pretty proud, proud of that whole stat because I'm rather certain it happened to me and I noticed <laughs> because I was like getting really annoyed that YouTube uh, kept on looking like junk. Yes. And I'm used to watching on float plane, so I could tell. Um, so I kept changing it back up, and I was like, what is going on? And I remembered that there used to be the default setting, so I was like hunting for it, and I couldn't find it. I was like, something's wrong. Um, I'm pretty sure, I don't know at all, but I'm pretty sure you can teach it. I think you can teach it. I think so. I think if you keep forcing yep. it to go up, it'll naturally slowly uh, increase mine, a bit. I'm pretty sure mine defaults to 4K. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've noticed that behavior, so... If you actually care, maybe do it. Um, you but, know what's annoying yeah. to me is that I'm probably going to end up with a ton of YouTube premium subscriptions now because all the different, depending on which profile I'm logged into, while I'm, because a lot of the time I'm not necessarily using YouTube for leisure. I'm actually using it for work. I'm, I'm checking a video or I'm finding a timestamp so I can send it to an editor or, do, or whatever else it is I'm doing. And... I've complained about this to YouTube many times, but something about the way that the, the sessions are handled makes it so that when you click out of Creator Studio onto a video, you get served an ad, I kid you not, 100% of the time. Like every single f***ing time I get an ad while I'm working, trying to watch my, like get something out of my own video, which... As far as I know, wasn't that against Google's terms of service at some point, clicking your own ads? I think it always has been. Like, you would think, logged into my own account, I would not get an ad on my own video. Because you clearly, think? clearly, that is self-dealing. Clearly, right? And it's, I, 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 this isn't me just saying, oh, well, there should be different rules for me and for other people. I'm saying from a common sense standpoint, you shouldn't pay me whatever it is, 35 or 45% or whatever of my own ad consumption. Duh, right? But it does. Something that annoys does serve the, the crap out of me is I use the different like uh, uh, Google profile things for my browser. Yes. So I have like a work one, I have a personal one, I have other various work ones. Get whatever. ready to get premium for all of them because otherwise you're going to have ads, ads everywhere, everywhere and you're not going to be able to watch 4K. Yeah. So like I have premium on my personal one, 
but in the relatively rare occasion that I open YouTube on my work one, it splashes me with an ad right away, and then I have to throw the video that I wanted to watch for work into my personal YouTube, which means that it gets lost from the history, and when I need to find it later, it's annoying. I'm just like, man, if I'm actively signed into one premium account on this computer, like, I'm, it's not like I'm sharing it with other devices. It no. would be nice if it made it so that it wouldn't serve ads on all of them. But Riddle me this. Whatever. Where's your line? If YouTube said, no, 1440p and up, uh, that's premium now. What if they said 1080p and up is premium? 720 is all is more than anyone should need. This where's becomes... your Where's the line where you kind of go from, okay... I could kind of understand this from an infrastructure cost scaling standpoint to oh, no, okay. this is bullshit. I won't take it anymore. And like, you know, t tell me, t walk me through your reaction at each stage. So we've already got your 4K reaction. Yeah. They let's say they cut off 1440p. That's that's also very reasonable in my opinion. In your opinion, okay, yeah. okay. I mean, 1440p is not nearly the increase in data rate that 4k is it's i think it's about double 1080p if i recall correctly that's 2560 yeah, by 144 1080p is two megapixels ish yeah i think it's about four it's like four and change or something like that or close to four so it's about uh, double but it's not 4x which is you know good yeah i i still think that's in a premium tier of resolutions though if i could say that but youtube's 1080p looks like dog crap it does so 1440p but it's also a free platform is it free if you pay in if your you time pay in your time with ads so it's only sort of free right like there's to be clear i'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here i don't necessarily disagree with luke it's free in the sense that it is broadly no available monetary exchange exactly you don't need to own a credit card to use it you don't need to be an yeah. adult to use it you can be anyone anywhere in the world as long as you don't have an oppressive government that blocks access to it or whatever and you can benefit from the wealth of of creation and knowledge that is on youtube which which is great it's it's amazing right um but it's not free there's, a, really, there's an interesting right? there's an interesting com comment in Flowplane. A lot of people are saying 1080p is their line, um, and I see one person who said 1080p should be free because competition said so. So here's where I'm going to throw a bit of a monkey what wrench in things. Exactly. So this is where my line is actually a lot lower because ultimately I'm going to end up keep continuing to use it because there's content on YouTube that I cannot access elsewhere, including. I've seen an example from you about like fixing a washing machine. I fairly recently had to fix my dryer, my clothes dryer. There you go. How was I going to do that without YouTube? You were To be completely honest, I wasn't. You were going to pay someone like yeah. $400 to lot. come and replace some stupid little $20 part. Yeah. That's I, what it, you would do. The the like no coin offense. collection thing. No, yeah, yeah. The coin collection thing was like jammed. And in a lot of them, you can access it from the front. In mine, you can't. You have to take the entire thing apart. There it's a go. huge pain. Um, and there was like the manual that you could read. And I was like, wow, th I'm going to break this for sure. Or there's the YouTube video of the the dude just being like, all right, so I unscrawl these things, yeah. toss it over there. Watch out for this. Do whatever. Yeah. And it's like, okay, five to 10 minutes later, I kind of know what to do and I can replay this a million times and it's fine. And I would have watched that in very low resolution with ads on it because it's it's that or nothing um luke owns a laundromat no <laughs> i think you meant lint collector or coin collector it's called a coin collector on oh. mine oh okay i don't know if it has like an actual name uh on mine it's called a coin collector i don't know um cool oh i see what people are saying for coin -up. no it's like not when that it's kind in the wash like like uh little bits of things would get like uh pfft, ejected but it doesn't want to go down the water pipe oh so it's like a mesh filter that collects like things i have never that cleaned water. that on mine did yeah. you say it was your dryer why does it have water in it is it water? maybe it was the washer it's been a while since i did okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> do you put water in your dryer because it probably takes a long time to using this wrong a long time. yeah that's probably why it broke <laughs> <laughs> yeah no sorry it's been like quite a bit so where's your line that. 720p oh, 
see, this is where it gets complicated because even if it was 480, there are use cases where I would still use it. Right, but what if you were trying to follow a tutorial, like a software tutorial at 480p, and you can't read the bloody text? But not everything that I would do is watching a software tutorial. Oh. I'm also trying to devil's advocate a little bit, right. but not too much, because with the dryer example, I could have, or whatever it was, well, <laughs> the, the thing... <laughs> Turns out it was a waffle iron. <laughs> <laughs> with the closed do to things machine that I yeah, have. With an oven. <laughs> uh, um... I would have watched that in, in 480. I don't know if it would have been, like, functional to watch below 480. Sure. Um, but, like, if it's a free thing, if when it starts playing an ad, I can just put my phone down and start grabbing my tools or whatever, and when it's done playing an ad, I can start trying to follow the tutorial, I'm going to still use the service because there's nothing else out there like it. What is it even called? Daily Motion? That's not a realistic competitor. Yeah, I get real. Yeah. So like I Vimeo has gone the line is hard tough. down the we are just a paid platform. Yeah, because it makes sense because it's really expensive to serve video. So like I would love to be like 1080p is my line because below that it kind of sucks. But no, I'm gonna keep using the platform if it's lower than that. Ultimately, I've already subscribed to premium, so this problem doesn't really affect me. But I think that's true for a lot of people. Transit Biker on Twitch says, as a person on a fixed income, I find this whole thing as a way of propagating and promoting socioeconomic discrimination. Making poor people be stuck with inferior quality is super cringe move at best. I mean, that's what, you know, your your, your free market is supposed to alleviate. It's supposed to create competition that drives pricing down. The issue here is that YouTube is in a position where They're they can monopoly. essentially do whatever they want yeah. because there isn't any competition. That's my whole argument for lowering the bar. And the reason that there isn't any competition is because nobody can make this cost effective. No. And like we 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 have actually done a lot more a lot more work on that than almost anyone else. Like to, you know, for real though, not me, like him yeah, and yeah, the float plane yeah. team. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so- you're, you're the CEO of the company wearing the shirt. And so, hey, yeah, it's my float plane shirt. Yeah. Um, and, 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 it, and it's tough. I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah, that sucks. I mean, honestly, honestly, suck. should there be, uh, maybe, this is, maybe this is a separate conversation, but should there be a similar price break for services like YouTube Premium or Netflix or Steam games for low income people who live in high income countries, right? Like in the, so YouTube Premium is like two bucks in some countries, like, like two, three American dollars a month. In America, it's over 10. But there are people living in North America who are on such low incomes the, yeah, I, I forget how much it is, it 12 or $13 or, or like whatever it is in the U.S. I'm sorry, I, for heads. I'm Canadian and I have a family plan, so I actually do not know the exact amount. Yeah. This is not me not knowing how much a banana costs. I just don't know because I'm Canadian, okay? But the point is that there are people for whom even that 2 or $3 could be a stretch, let alone, yeah. let alone being something that is comfortable for them. So how do we solve that, right? Because... Theoretically, mentioned... you know, we, we, theoretically, we have different prices in these different geopolitical regions, but in practice, these are extremely coarse and in many cases, kind of arbitrary lines. I've, I've mentioned this in the past, and it's hyper unpopular, and I'm going to win no fans right oh, now. Boy. I've mentioned it I'll on Wayne show. You. I'll uh, defend your uh, hot takes. <laughs> we're playing, we're doing some role reversal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've met, and I know it's like, not okay. To be completely clear, All right. I think the All only right. solution is government ran. Which is so not okay for a totally different giant ball of wax. Okay, but so. Maybe. Hold on. You legislate the availability of 4K YouTube... Like like all the premiumness, whatever. 4K is a human, right? For, yeah, I don't know about 4K. Hold I'm on. Saying like, no, no, no. Okay. For real though. For real though. Hold okay, on. Okay. So full full quality, no ads, 4K, in public libraries. Oh, that's sweet. So that way, oh. you can allow free market capitalism, and if people want to have their their private access to to their high quality YouTube, they can pay. But that would make it available 
to everyone in the same way that you can buy books and so you, you can maintain so a personal library or you can go to the public library and you can access them there. Now, to be clear, not every community has okay. proper well, functioning community infrastructure like public libraries, um, especially not anymore now that books are out of fashion and stuff. Public libraries are changing. Let me talk about that in a second. I need to sure. defend my thing. There's a bunch sure. of people who are like, that's a horrible idea. I know. That's why I prefaced it by saying it's a horrible idea. My reason for saying that is because a lot of non-economically viable things basically have to go to governments if you want them to be maintained because businesses are going to go, hey, this isn't economically viable. And they're going to stop it. doing it. Yeah. So that that's why I say that. Not because I want that. I think it's a horrible idea. There's tons of massive problems with it. It is not cool. Um, but okay, public libraries. I want to talk about that. Public libraries have changed a bunch. Um, there are local public libraries that have tools. Have you heard about this? No. They that have is tools. so cool. You can go sign out a tool so that you can like go home and work do on maintenance things or whatever. do maintenance public libraries are becoming they're continuing to be in the spirit of what they always were which is communal resources that we all share yeah as an as an option you can absolutely buy your own tools or books or, or books or high or speed games or YouTube. movies or whatever now sure. there's there's a bunch of them that have um, they're actually technically pirated, but because of laws around public libraries, they were pirated in a completely legal way. But you, there's, there's certain libraries, I know of this in the States, I yeah. don't know of this in Canada, there are certain libraries in the States that have just straight up pirated games, and you can go sign them out, take them home, and play the pirated game completely legally, as long as you like also return it how to you're supposed library. to, to the library. Everything is above board because of laws around libraries specifically. Libraries are adapting. It's very cool. I wish I knew more about it. I didn't expect we were going to talk about libraries on the Wine Show. Ninja Star um, and Floatplane Chat is talking about some libraries having 3D printers. Yeah. Yes. That's super cool. Yeah, I forgot about that, but that's totally a thing. Yeah. They're turning into like sort of maker spaces. That's a but... way that you could have a relatively low impact on Google's ability to run YouTube as a profitable business while also making a, a real like tangible effort to make this, this, this amazing resource that YouTube is. I think we need in all of this, we need to not lose track of that. YouTube is unprecedented. Yeah. It's amazing. We have to, yeah, there's a lot of things wrong with it. A lot sure. of warts. Oh, yeah. A lot of warts. Yep. I don't agree with everything they do. Not even close. But a world without YouTube would be extremely different. Yes. And so I think that figuring out a way to bridge this gap, yeah, absolutely has to happen. Yeah. Someone, but someone you, said can't in... just, you can't just say, well, it's not fair. I should have access to everything on the platform with no ads and the highest quality. There are... They're 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 a business. I I and you know what? We could have a way longer conversation about you know capitalism versus other 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 systems, right? Sure, you know you can have that conversation, but within the bounds of the system that we all live in at this point, not all of us, I guess, but we do. Um, there are limits. There are limits to what yeah. we can expect, right? And you're not going to be able to expect a for-profit corporation to just take a loss on something out of the, you know, good feelings that it will make for people. Yeah. I mean, you can you can hope for that. It's but not going to happen. Yeah, you're going to... It's not going to happen. Don't hold your breath. That company's going to go under anyways. <laughs> so, like, even if they did do it, they're just going to die. Um, a bunch of people in chat talking about cool things that their libraries have. Yeah, temporary books on Kindles and stuff. Man, Someone that's... talking about uh, uh, gaming PCs and laptops available for for temporary borrow. Shut up. Um, that's so cool. It's and and again, it's not every library. And someone brought up a very major issue that libraries in low income areas can sometimes just suck. I I don't know. That's probably fairly legit. Um, but all I'm saying is that is that libraries are changing. They're not necessarily just books now. Yeah. Um, they are they're trying to evolve from beyond that. Trust AFT says uh, their local library runs D and D sessions. That's super cool. Yeah. yeah that's super that's sweet. Cool. 
Yeah. I just want to point out that Prime Gaming Soviet Rambo in chat um, said that putting 4K behind a paywall has already been utilized by um, pornographic uh, naked sites. YouTube just copying them again. If you <laughs> if you want to see about uh, people copying those types of uh, platforms and filming styles, look into the evolution of cameras and also look into the evolution of online video existing at all. <laughs> yeah. Because you owe a lot of it to that. <laughs> a lot more than you probably know. Yeah. Wild. Um, on the subject of uh, viewer uh, viewer interactions here, guys, don't forget about merch messages. Uh, don't use Twitch bits. Don't send super chats or whatever else. Send merch messages over on lttstore.com. We've got a bunch of stuff that's back in stock. Multi-nep t-shirts the, the rgb i think it's the t-shirt that's back in stock uh we've also got the workshop jacket we've got uh, the short circuit sweatpants that launched recently and we've got an announcement for you guys so if you're in the checkout you will have the option to fill out a merch message when we're live and our producer dan is going to either pop up your merch message down here or answer it for you or both it can pop up with an answer or curate it so that it's something that we can talk about later on on the show Oh, we have the original classic lids from our... Oh, yeah, here we go. So our current water bottles come with these lids, but we are now stocking the classic screw top lids like that one for $5.99. And we have an end of season deal on our swim trunks. Uh, we are clearing out our inventory of them at $24.99. So you will see some new swimwear next year. Let me just bring that up for you guys. I also have one other pretty exciting announcement for the store, and you guys are going to want to move pretty quick styles on that. 40 reviews, four and a half stars, not bad. Unlike Logitech, we do not um, conceal the the reviews that are not 100% positive, unless they are spam. We do remove spam. Yeah. Uh, here it is. Right, wait, am I am I ready to announce this yet? How do I how do I know if it's live? That? Yeah. Like, is he watching? Okay. So, okay. All right. We're doing it. We're doing it. There are only 69 available. That's right. We've got another limited edition product. Sarah pushed hard for this one. She was like, oh man, we should totally do, we should totally do a gold controller version of the, of the controller character from I the ABCs your, of your gaming book. Of her voice. Yeah, she doesn't sound anything like that. Yeah. But it's super cute. Um, honestly speaking, guys, this is a novelty item. It doesn't have alpaca wool in it. It, um, it, it, you know, the, the gold fabric, yeah, just kind of like, you know, crumply and stuff. But it's super cute and it's gold. It's a gold controller. Uh, are you wanting me to switch to that camera? Oh, that's not the one. Loop cam. There you go. It's gold. Uh, they are individually numbered. There will be 69 only. I have no idea how much they cost. It's not cheap because, yeah, it's limited edition and you'll, you know, they'll be sold regardless of how much we charge for them. Um, and they come with this cute little sticker. Look. Okay, look, it's actually a ton of work to do a product. A one-off, and we especially can't, in such low run. Yeah, we can't do a ton of volume of something like this because we're not going to sell that many. So essentially, it's expensive because you're subsidizing the, you know, the larger production run costs that you would normally have to pay in order to make a product at all because we only made like 72 of them or something like that, whatever it works out to, to make sure that we have a couple spares in case something goes wrong. Oh, apparently it's 69.69. Hilarious. Uh, it comes with a little uh, golden controller sticker as well. And uh, and then a signed signed card thing that is in here. I think I'm supposed to sign You're these on the show. Them. Certificate of Authenticity. Uh, 1 to 69 of 69. Uh, this is one of 69 official Linus Tech Tips gold controller plushies. Nice. <laughs> you gotta, I wonder... Classic. You gotta make number 69 out of 69 special. We're live on the what now? They are live on the website. Oh, they're live on the site. Okay, okay, they're up apparently. There they go. There they go. All right. Uh, why don't we move on to our next topic here? Yeah. Which GPU do we want to talk about? I don't know. Which one do you want to like talk about? I feel like that's the news. I want to talk about the ARC. 
to be completely okay, honest. Okay, let's talk about the Ark. Which I one? Of the this... Covenant? Yeah. Survival? No. Ark of the Covenant. Okay, Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Covenant. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, yeah. Indy should have opened it. <laughs> <laughs> he was pure of heart enough that he would have been fine. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, no, sorry. Because taking artifacts from elsewhere and bringing them back to your home country is very pure of heart. Yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> Okay, Indy's less of a modern hero, more of a, yeah, more heroic. Yeah, a little bit. With a different, different yeah. in a different time. Anyways, Intel Arc A770 and A750 reviewed and streamed. I thought that was cool. That was a good idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah I thought that was a good idea too. That was Alex's idea. Good. Um, after years of exciting announcements and then months of radio silence, Intel has finally released their ARC GPUs. Their pricing, the A750 8GB is $289, the A770 8GB is $329, and the same card, but in the 16GB variant, is $349. But, there's complications. Yeah. Um, Horrific driver problems. Rebar I mean, required. If it's not DX12 or Vulcan, oh boy, okay. you might not even want to play it. We got some games that were not DX12 or Vulcan that they gamed. You know, oh. they were gaming. Okay. Oh yeah, they were gaming on, I didn't the, watch on the stream. The whole stream so. Okay. Yeah. I'm. Most things were pretty playable, and the problems that we had on older or lighter games. Are they seriously sold out. Running they? older AP. Oh, of course they are. Uh, running older APIs, the problems that we had were not necessarily ones that every casual user would experience. Like Alex, for example, was finding the wild FPS, like frame time swings in Rocket League, unplayable. I, a Rocket League moron... I was just going to say, you don't play, and he probably does, right? He plays hard. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I see the frame times are all over the place. And it's definitely less smooth than my RTX 3060 over here beside you. Sure. But this would not affect my ability to play this game. You know what I mean? But it could be the same thing in Beat Saber, okay? You give me those kinds of frame time variances, I'm going to be like, this is unplayable! Blah! I'm going like, hurling all over the place. Right? Yeah. You know, so it depends, on, it depends on your skill level. So if you're a casual gamer, I would say that many games were quite playable, Many were problematic. I think this is this is a sidebar thing, but yeah. if you remember correctly, the first time in many years that I actually felt my computer performance not being where I wanted it to be was with Beat Saber. Because I started getting into difficulties where it was too fast, and I, I was started to lag. Yes. I was just like, it's well, noticeable. This, this sucks, yeah. At, the, at those speeds, uh, you know, nine milliseconds of stutter or whatever. And when you're in VR, like, it's... Ooh, very off-putting. It's not like there's certain games like you know if you can't afford the upgrade you can fight through it. It's fine. Beat Saber, like no, you put that game down, you do something else. Um, but anyways, back on topic. So this raises a lot of questions with all the experience that Intel has making GPUs, and they do. Yeah. Right. They, they they've been doing onboard yeah. GPUs for like over ten years now. Right on their on their CPUs and 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 they've even gotten a lot better. Oh yeah, they they've made major pushes. You know whether it's like Iris or like early XE onboard or you know whatever else. Right? But they've made major pushes in improving these. From actually, man, no, Intel's been doing onboard graphics since before that. They used to have their onboard chipset graphics too. Oh uh -huh, yeah, Intel's been doing onboard yeah. graphics flipping forever. So it raises the question: if they've made their way all the way through DirectX 10, 9, 8, 7, all so far back. How can they suck at it so much? The teams are disconnected or something? I don't no. Know. Oh. It's more interesting than that. Oh. With onboard graphics, one of the main tasks of the software uh -huh. team is to take as much GP lo GPU load away as possible and put it onto the CPU. Anything they can, pull it off that weak sauce GPU, put that on the CPU, put it on those general purpose processing cores. With a dedicated graphics card, well, it's the other way around, isn't it? Yeah. You, you want to do as little as possible on the CPU. I mean, that's one of the big innovations recently is allowing the GPU to talk directly to system memory even, right? Because that's what we want. 
You don't want us to go through that processing unit. Why are we adding bottlenecks? Yeah. CPUs, and, and that's another thing. CPUs used to be like very fast compared to GPUs. Now, <laughs> it's not really necessarily the case. We're going to put a whole computer in your computer. <laughs> hey, thanks, Mumbles Malarkey. Um, so that's a big challenge. It is also my understanding that, hey, this is a first-gen product, right? Like, there, it, it's very clear from the power consumption, the die size, um, the just like the elaborate design of the card itself, even. Like, that's an, you guys got to understand, that's an expensive cooler on Intel's Arc GPUs. There's a lot of plastic molding that went into it. it, it it's, it's premium, right? Um, that's not the kind of cooler you design for a $289 yeah. graphics card. Yeah. So there's a lot of indicators that Intel intended for this product. The width of the memory bus, for example, 256 bit. There's a lot of indicators that Intel intended for this to be a much higher end product, something that would compete more with an RTX 3070. But what it seems to me is that even with the hard work that the software team is undoubtedly doing, there could be some just plain architectural stumbles that were made. And at some point, Intel had to make the call. Do we respin this again to the point where it's going to launch at the same time as the next generation Battle Mage, which cannot be delayed, right? So if you guys watched our video touring the Intel Fab, which I think you probably did, yeah. right? You see that there are actually multiple generations of product, products in flight, right? At the same time. So if you delay one of them, you can actually end up stomping right on top of its launch with a next generation, way better, way more cost-effective product. We actually saw this happen with Broadwell. Do you remember Broadwell? The 5775C was the flagship Broadwell desktop CPU. Broadwell was, I believe, a, a moderate success in mobile. But on desktop, the 5775C launched, and then almost immediately, yeah. the 6700K yeah. Skylake architecture came out and replaced it. So here, here we go. 5775C came out June 2nd, 2015. Okay, or at least that's when the uh, article went up on a non-tech. And August 5th, 2015. Uh, oh, wait. May 5th, 2020? Oh, no, no, yeah. August 5th, 2015, Skylake launched. So, like, K. Okay. It had two months of being the hotness before immediately there was a better product. So, at some point, the ARC team had to look at it and go, well, we're either going to launch Alchemist... Or we're not. <laughs> and, you know, you can imagine how these things work, right? Because the software team is working before there's final hardware. The hardware team is working on the hardware before there's final software. It's, it's a hope and a prayer that any of this stuff works at all, right? <laughs> so they might have gotten back to silicon, thought, we can fix this in software. I'm speculating right now. We can fix this in software. Then they get to a point in the software where they're like, holy crap, we need to fix this in hardware. Rinse and repeat, right? Well, you can only go through that cycle so many times before you, reach, before you run out of window for where you're actually going to be able to deliver a product. So I, th I think it is entirely conceivable that Intel fully understands that this is going to be a bit of a limited product and hopefully they can take those those learning outcomes and apply them to battle mage apply them to celestial which are their upcoming generations of products and and this is not going to be something where um management goes well that wasn't successful let's just kill it i i, I sincerely hope and i sincerely doubt I, yeah, I, I, i'm on board as well. I, I doubt that that is that's what's going to happen in spite of all the i think the rumors of gaming intel gaming gpus death have been greatly exaggerated if these arc gpus did not have the you know dx12 and vulcan or bust issues how well do you think they would have done a lot better yeah but like is this something you strongly recommend at that price point it's tough yeah. if it uh, again if it doesn't have that problem here's something we ran into during the stream we noticed, and I don't know for sure that this is an ARC issue. Uh, this could have been an issue with our displays or capture cards. So don't don't take take this for what it is. It's it's uh, it's an observation. We noticed that when we were cloning our display 
okay, between our capture card and the monitor that I was gaming on. We actually had some issues with the NVIDIA card around this too, where it was running at 120 hertz and the mouse was smooth, but dragging windows was horrible. I don't know. We I forget how we ended up solving it, but we did we did ultimately solve it. It was really dumb. Okay. Uh, but on the Intel side, we were getting uh, the limited uh, limited uh, gamma value thing. So we were in limited mode, which is for TVs of so like sixteen to two thirty five or whatever it is, instead of full range, which is zero to two fifty five, which was causing the stream to look fine. Because I think that device was expecting a okay. limited input, yeah. and then the monitor looked like crushed and clipped because it was expecting a full range input, and there wasn't an obvious way in Intel's dashboard to fix that. Hmm. So just because the performance is okay, and just because we value competition in the marketplace, doesn't necessarily mean that I can unequivocally say, "Go for it! It's going to be a great experience. You're going to love it." Right, because if you enjoy messing around with things more than I can wholeheartedly games, recommend it. Yeah, it it looks honestly, it sounds very interesting. Just to like that, that's why I was happy that you guys did that stream. I haven't. It's I mean, it's long. I haven't watched the whole thing. It's got timestamps um, now, so you can just check specific games I, if I you're into that. Saw that comment, yep. uh, but I was happy that you guys did that because it's just so interesting. Yeah, like it, it's very cool for that fact. But if you want something. That's like rock solid, reliable, and you can play games all the time. Yeah. Hmm. Nvidia yeah. and AMD have a little more experience. I just hope enough people buy them that yes. the whole project doesn't get canned. Yeah. Because I really want to see Battle Mage. I really want to see beyond that. Intel has some serious. I, I think Intel, to be clear, haven't seen Radeon 7000 yet. But I think from what I know about their organize, organizational structures, I think Intel is a much more credible competitor to NVIDIA when it comes to machine learning. Oh, okay. okay. Compared to AMD. Yeah, I was going to say with the with the whole, um, I can't think of the name for it right now, but like stitched together cores. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. Why is this escaping me as well? Yeah. Now you've thrown me off. But chiplets. With that, chiplet yeah, design. with chiplets. There we go. Well, uh, I am pretty... <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I didn't know you were going with machine learning. But before you were going with machine learning, I yep. was thinking, mm, the chiplets might change everything yep. up. But the uh, thing is that so much of gaming performance for us to continue to improve from here, I don't necessarily think Jensen's correct that Moore's Law is dead, but as we talked about earlier certainly slowed down and i think a lot of the improvements harder. to gaming performance going forward are going to be driven by machine learning and not just not just gaming for gamers but also gaming for developers right i mean in a world where you can just kind of uh you know make a brown box and then just tell your ai texture generator yeah it's wood <sighs> right like that's a game changer oh yeah <laughs> right uh <laughs> Took me a second. Um, yeah, it totally is, though, actually. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. Core Dog asks, who from LTT is going to buy an Intel Arc? If, I mean, is this one of those things where I should just, like, put my money where my mouth is, go to Memory Express, buy an Arc, put it on my mantle, and just be like, okay, I walked the walk. I technically bought one. I just put it on a shelf. I don't know if that counts. If I, I think I've said it before, and I would still say it now. If I was still buying hardware, I would seriously consider it. Because it's just so interesting. And I would find playing different games and testing them and stuff, I would find that interesting. But that's not going to be for most people, for sure. Um, and and there are the... You, you brought up last oh, time... No. You brought up the social issues, like if you can't play some game with your friends, Yeah, it sucks. okay, so are you ready? Yeah. We've been challenged. The 30-day arc challenge? 30-day arc challenge. I'm down. Are you going to actually do it this time, though? I Mr. did it! Mr. I'm going to install Linux it. on my computer and then play VR games for the entire duration of the That's challenge? That's not fair. I, I played VR games a handful of times. <laughs> and you just, uh, okay, and you just avoided PC gaming the whole time, though. That's a valid result. <laughs> That's a valid outcome. That's fair enough. It's a valid outcome. <laughs> It was too much work to game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. It actually was. <laughs> to be clear, yeah. State of Linux gaming changed a lot since then, even. 
Like, man, Steam Deck is kind of wild. We did know that was likely to happen, Yes, to be fair. But I, I'm glad we tried it before it got easy mode. I'm glad to have had yes. the experience. Yeah. Trial by fire, man. I'm forged. LTT Labs Jake uh, says I'll be buying one for my wife. Wow. What a, you're going to throw, throw under that I mean, bus. Yeah, wife for now. <laughs> Why do you hate your wife? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully she likes di diagnosing why games are hard to play. Um, <laughs> or or hopefully you know that the game in then in brackets S that she plays um, works well on it, I guess. Okay. Loser shaves their beard. That's... <laughs> wow. I saw that. I didn't want to say it because I really don't want to do that. Well, how do you lose, though? You game on anything other than an ARC GPU. Okay, then I think I'll be fine. Okay, I could I could do it for a month. I could do it for a month. Okay. I've done it before. I've I've put friendships on pause for a month. Okay, sure. Why All not? Right. Arc challenge. Yeah. Uh, not this go. weekend. We're gonna. Ha I don't know if we have enough arcs, <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll set a start date and uh, yeah, yeah. We'll do we'll do the arc challenge. Yeah. Okay. All right. VR sure. included. Uh, Crap. Um, it's a game. All right. All right. My deal, uh, my deal for that though, is that I don't want to be the one that has to change the GPUs in my computers and put them back. I'll do my personal rig. I don't want to do like the VR machine or whatever. Oh, okay. Just because it's like a lot of work and that's not actual content creation. So uh, Dan, can you swap my <laughs> GPUs for ARCs, please? Sure. Okay. You only you. have like one computer, right? Nothing complicated? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. No, okay. In all seriousness though, I'm not trying to just be a diva. When we do videos at my house that actually disrupt my personal setup yeah, and my personal it sucks, life. I'm sure. Yeah. It, and, and we do it often. People often leave my place in a state where uh, if I had done it at work, there's two or three hours of putting things back to the way they were that is typically handled by the writer or by logistics or whatever else that, that like shouldn't actually be a CEO task that just gets dumped on me when we do things at my house. Like it's actually kind of unfair. So that's my, that's my only requirement. I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to lose. And ne neither we're both way too stubborn. So it like, doesn't really matter what the stakes are. Neither of yeah. us are going to give up before 30 days. Yeah. <laughs> I would never give it up or let it down. <laughs> hey, we should probably uh, never give up Sponsors? talking about our sponsors. Yeah. yeah, man, we've got a lot of topics to get through. Good gravy. We're going to do show and tell. Luke hasn't seen an RTX 4090 in That's person true. yet. Yep. And we brought all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to see all the different 4090s? I also 4090s? actually haven't seen anyone holding one. I haven't watched a video or seen a picture of anyone holding one. I have heard anecdotes of how big they are. Prepare to prepare yourself. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Uh, let's talk through some sponsors, though. The show is brought to you by Zoho One. If you run a business, you probably know how hard it is to keep everything organized. But Zoho One is designed to help you run your entire business through a single unified platform. So you can replace your patchwork of cloud applications, legacy tools, and paper-based processes with one system. Zoho One will help build your company's presence across marketing channels, send prospects the right messages, and measure ROI with out-of-the-box insights. And they have a comprehensive set of account tools to organize your business finances, track payables, manage bills and expenses, and even monitor your business's financial health. Whether it's sales, marketing, finance, analytics, or support, Zoho One has got you covered. So sign up today using the link below and you can get a free 30-day trial with no credit card required. The show is also brought to you by Squarespace. In 2022, your brand or business needs an online presence. That's not shilling. That's not marketing. That's just a fact. It's just a thing. It's a thing. Building your own website might seem daunting, but Squarespace is there to make it easier than figuring out how the self-serve line works at your local, local grocery store. That's actually in the talking points. That's very funny because I have had trouble with that sometimes, especially when there's a cashier like standing next to it. Like, are you, uh, are you doing it or uh, <laughs> am I? Uh, <laughs> and if you're standing here, why am I doing it? Yeah. <laughs> like, because I've seen ones where there's one standing at every one. I'm like, 
that's maybe they're that's transitioning weird. or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Squarespace is the easy to use platform to build your online presence right away. With one click, you are off and ready to start selling or promoting anything and everything on the old interwebs. Local business, portfolio, blog, wedding, Squarespace has ready to use and easy to customize themes and templates. They even look great on mobile devices. If you already have a website, Squarespace makes it super simple to port your domain over and start using their customization and marketing tools to really stand out. They offer 24 seven support, which I could say the same about the self-service checkout line. And you can get started on your website today at squarespace.com slash when to get 10% off your first purchase. And we've got a classic sponsor back. Okay. What is maple cayenne uncured bacon jerky? Is this is this the new equivalent for my maple buffalo bacon, or is this different? I was assuming when I saw it that it would have been, and mojo jalapeno was my favorite one. So I think I think that's what they did. I hope so, because yeah. I have I have missed my savage jerky here. Uh, savage jerky. It's made with premium quality beef, so and their bacon jerky is crafted. Oh, uh, well, all of it is, uh, and bacon, and it's crafted in small batches. Okay, these talking points are a mess, but don't worry about it. The point is, they're <laughs> delicious in quality. They have daring flavors from mild to wild, like maple cayenne, jalapeno mojo, and ginger lemongrass. They're all natural with no preservatives, no artificial ingredients or gluten salivating already they're high in protein i mean obviously paleo slash keto friendly and they even have low sodium options available so you can save 10 percent on your order today using offer code wanshow 22 and learn more about savage jerky at the link in the video description it's been years and just immediately i know right immediately started salivating mm. yeah the maple cayenne is my is my is my one mm, that jerky <laughs> Someone tagged me. Was like, "That's not chicken. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> this is good." I mean, you say that like you're surprised. Oh, it's been a while. It tastes mm. like. I mean, mine didn't have a name change, and it tastes about the same as it used to. Mm -hmm. Does yours taste different? Mm -mm. Mm. All right. You want to see some forty nineties? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna go get them. You want to talk about some notes? Sure. Mm -hmm. Where is the topic? Some 4090 notes. The public has received their first glimpse of the 4090s. I'm intentionally not looking up right now. And they are big news. Literally. They're huge. While the Founders Edition is shorter in length than the 3090 Ti, it is thicker and wider. And some add-in board cards are comedically large, apparently. The Asus ROG makes the already massive Founder Edition card feel downright reasonable. Jace Two Cents did a size comparison video. Mm, I'm sure he did. <laughs> um, where he compared it to the PlayStation 5. What? <laughs> I'm still not looking up. That's crazy. Uh, he also tried installing the Asus card in the Leon Lee Landcool. Uh, Jay again? What? Uh, oh, I don't Land know what cool. this is. Jay again. Some Lee and Lee Land cool case. Okay. And it looks like uh, it won't fit in any smaller mid-tower cases. In many. In many. Luke's tired. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, also, I'm also dyslexic. Um, power usage. Board partners have announced their recommended PSUs for the 4090. Many are using the same 850-watt PSU suggestions as NVIDIA, but Asus and Gigabyte are recommending a minimum of 1,000 watts. And... I always forget, Palette, Palette? Palette. Palette is recommending a 1,200 watt minimum. Okay. Let's begin. Whoa! No, 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 no. This is a 3090. Okay. Okay. Let's begin it's, with a 3090. I have also never held or actually seen in person one of these, and that is absurd. Yeah. Uh, oh, hey, Dan, do you want to uh, do the camera? Let's play Luke Show and Tell for a little bit here. So I've I've been saying for a long time a little little joke about how GPUs are just little computers inside your computer because um, they like totally are if you yeah. look at them in an architectural way. Lift up a little high. This weighs about the same weight as a little computer. Okay, so just you can stash that right here, and I'm gonna get you a forty ninety. Uh, who do you want first? Do you want colorful MSI uh, ASUS? To be fair, it looked a lot bigger when you or Zotac. Uh. I think we just send it. Go with Asus. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. First of all, still in the box. The package is your first hint. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a pretty. Uh, it's a thick box. Sure is. Thick box. Okay. We're gonna do a little live unboxing for you, ladies and gentlemen, here here on the WAN show. Okay. Uh, there's some discussion topics, by the way. There, it is. It is. I will say it is a little shocking. Like I've I've seen a lot of people holding 3090s. I knew they were they were huge, uh, but. Seeing and holding one in person, it is massive, and I haven't seen the 41 yet. Okay. Oh my goodness. Oh my god. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> my poor old, like, <laughs> GTX 260 I bought back in the day would just be embarrassed. Um, it doesn't feel like it's the same thing. This is a 3090. <laughs> For comparison, here if you, we okay, gotta get really, it a little higher okay, for yeah, the yeah, merch yeah. messages. No, Dan, don't chase us higher. The merch yeah, messages stop. cover it. Go down, uh, go down slightly. Yeah, yeah, you're good. You're there good. you go. Look at that. Okay, and thickness. Look at the thickness. What the heck is going on here? Like that is how many That's slots crazy. thick is that, Luke? Is that three or four? Three and a half? I think it's over three. Yeah, it's over three, and three and a half slots. Or four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely wild. You know what? Hold on. I'm gonna while you unbox so, the next one. It's heavy. While you unbox the next one, I'm gonna run and grab something a little more reasonable for scale. I'm gonna go grab a 1080. Okay. 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 Here, I'll give you the next one. What do you want next? What do you want next? Uh, just uh, hit me with anything. Doesn't matter. Okay. Oh. Zotac. Okay. Big box. Big box. These big, are these are boy. crazy. These are crazy. Just the cost in like metal. <laughs> That'd be quite a bit. How do I open the box? That's a. That's okay. I don't feel bad for being confused by that now. All right. Card looks sick though. It does look cool. It's also literally the size of a computer. Um. I have to lean away from the mic to do this, so I apologize. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Hi. He's back. Yeah, and like that wasn't a small card. No, no, not even a little. Okay, here we go, here we go. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> like what? Like here, thickness. Look at this. This is not a small GPU. No, not at all. This is a 1080. It's kind of big actually. Like it was relatively long. Yeah. And it's like where's the length difference between these? Like look at the look at the amount of like you said, the amount of metal. Yeah. On this thing. It 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 like this end I don't think you can see it quite as well. I'm going to angle it there. I'm going to angle it like that. It looks like a spaceship. Yeah. It's just huge. Yeah. Like, I think when I was holding the 3090 up to it, it was hard to tell the scale. But you got to understand, the 3090 was already ludicrously big. Yeah. Ridiculously big. Yeah. Okay. Just, I, I'm pretty sure... Yeah, I'm rather certain. Just the heat fins on here are bi just the heat fins are bigger than the entire 1080. Okay, this uh, MSI Supreme is that even bigger? Doesn't need an unboxing because it's already unboxed. I think this might shorter, be even thicker? thicker than that one. Yeah, it's shorter, but I think it's thicker. Yeah. Here, let's let's go like this. Hold it like this. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh uh, my goodness. Yeah, I think I think mine's a little thicker, Luke. Oh wow. Yeah. You know. You gotta, you gotta just, deal with what you got. I, I, I just, I can't even, you know. Okay, there's one, there's one last one here. We've got a, this we've got absurd. a colorful eye game. Okay, here we go. Ready? Here, you want to just, uh, uh, maybe just, yeah, just toss that down there. That's fine. Yeah, I'm, t it's, I'm sure it's fine. Okay, here we go. Is this like, did you save this for last for a reason? No, no, I don't okay. even know if this one's the biggest. I got the bottom. Okay. Yeah, you got yeah, There you go. Man, support braces are just going to be... Oh, my goodness. Okay. ...necessary. 
Yeah, did they do they ship with them? I don't know. I hope so. So one mm, no, not now that I'm not holding it in a weird way. Hold on, let's bring our 1080 back. <laughs> <laughs> oh no that's ridiculous yeah i mean to be clear um these are 1600 dollar gpus yeah you know uh for most people this is a non-issue um for for your pro wow. gamers out there you know i guess you gotta you might need to think about upgrading your 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 system you're good, Dan. Time to uh, yeah. uh what what about uh you know LTT store GPU support braces? I just you know if there's... you're buying one of these, maybe you can afford one in like pure gold or something. Yeah, there's there's so many different cases, and and honestly, so many different of these gigantic GPUs that I wouldn't even know I wouldn't even know where to begin to try to build a, a universal one. That's you know why I mean? I'd be surprised if there wasn't one that came in the box. To be honest. Oh, wow. Ah, there's a liquid cooled one back there too, a Supreme X from MSI. It's just, Sheesh. this is wild, man. Uh, our Sheesh. founders, I think, is was supposed to make its way over here after they were done filming. Dan, did it never materialize over there? I will go find it. No, 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 no. You're good. You're good. You're good. It's okay. It basically looks like the 3090, but bigger. It's ridiculous. Find a mini ITX motherboard and plug it in. <laughs> I know, right? There's gonna be there's gonna be builds where the GPU Someone's is gonna do that. larger than the entire rest of the computer, including yeah. like a giant an NHD fourteen. Like you know, that's that's pretty wild. Anywho, they were. I think that's the first time that I've ever felt a personal computer component that wasn't a case, and been like, "Wow, this is genuinely heavy." Yeah, like it's never been a thing before. That's crazy. Yeah, I can see that. How big is too big? That I, big. I, I joked in my unboxing of, of one of them on, on Short Circuit. I, I joked that it feels like a matter of time before your GPU just takes up all seven slots. And it's like a, just a big module that you plug in. Are we heading there? It feels like it. It like genuinely does. Um would that matter? What other PCIe cards do you need? And the, the rest of the computer is trying to get smaller <laughs> and more uh, like data traveling distance efficient and stuff like that. Um, like with, with drives coming onto the motherboard and stuff. It's going to turn into the situation where you have like this this weird module that you plug your GPU into and that's your whole thing. Why don't you just plug your computer into your GPU? Yeah, basically. <laughs> Seriously though. Have dedicated power to the graphics card. <laughs> Stop calling it a card. The graphics unit. It's crazy. I mean, that is what the U in GPU does stand for. Yeah, I know, I know. But <laughs> but it's not card. Is what I'm saying. Just yeah. Um, that's wild. I don't know. Um, I didn't necessarily know how it would make that that would make me feel. And and now that I've held them, I I still don't know. But you they're feel, absurd. You feel insecure. I don't want one. Which is a weird reaction, I think. But, like, that thing's ridiculous. I don't, like... I don't think I've ever held a computer component and immediately been like, this is unnecessary. As hardcore as I just did. <laughs> like, there is no reason this thing needs to exist in its current form. At least for me, I'm sure there's some people that'll do some crazy things with them that need every little tiny bit of power they can possibly get. Sure, I know there is applications out, like that. Some modded out, you know... Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or like machine learning applications or sure. some type of in whatever. Um, but like, wow. How much does one of those weigh? Like, do you have do you have that stat? I actually don't know, but a lot. Yeah. Let's see. Asus forty ninety weight. Let's see if it's listed here. Might not be because why would you bother include that with the graphics card? But it matters now. Oh yeah, okay. So it's yeah, three point six five slot. <laughs> Might as well just call it four. But yeah, it's it's not quite four technically. Right. Um, not quite four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't list weight here as far as I can see. Maybe they do. I just yeah. Maybe I they should start. It. Yeah. 
Because it seems like it's getting kind of necessary. It, it might actually matter. Yeah. Five pounds, someone said. That's a lot for a graphics card. Yeah. Yeah, crazy. So, here's something that I'm kind of struggling with a little bit lately. Mm. There was a comment on my AirPods Pro 2 video. By the way, for those of you wondering, uh, I was swiping on both sides to try to go back. It didn't make it into the cut, but I did try both sides. I do know the correct swipe for back gesture on iOS. Um, I kind of went on a rant about the some some unintuitive, to me, elements of iOS. Um, I get very frustrated by the absence of a back button because having a universal way to go back just seems very obvious to me. Um, and there was one comment in particular that I was kind of kind of sitting there going, you know, um, it, it, I'll just I'll just show you guys on the dock because I, I put it in there. It's like, is it is it me? Or <laughs> is it the children who are wrong? Basically, uh, the quote was, it's obstinance not to do things that are better for the user. That's that's what I said in the video. And uh, this is the response. Um, just say you, Linus. You're not every user. Uh, just because it's something you don't like doesn't mean it's the correct way. You do this nonsense with every video about iOS, macOS, and sometimes Linux. If something isn't the way you're used to doing things, then it's incorrect. As if he doesn't do it with Windows, too. Also, the back gestures on the other side. Like I said, I know that. I, I tried both ways. It wasn't working. Um, if it isn't the way I'm used to, then it's wrong. You have a massive sense of entitlement. So I guess I'm trying to figure out how to reconcile this because on the one hand, it's my job to advocate for things that are better. And from my point of view, there are things that are objectively better. Um, you know, one of the ones I always come back to even though a lot of people still don't really seem to T9. appreciate the value of it, is T9 dialing. Uh, T9 dialing is objectively faster. Pull out your phone. I'll pull out my phone at the same time. Call, I, I will be done calling before you are done. It, it's, it is actually faster. And the best thing about how it's faster is that it doesn't interfere with any of the other ways of dialing. You could still dial by numbers and have things autocomplete like that, or you could still look up a contact list. So my way of dialing, which is objectively faster, also objectively does not interfere with however you want to do things. I don't see that as a sense of entitlement. And so I guess I, I just, I get kind of, I get kind of lost sometimes because I'm supposed to be saying, yeah, here is something that would make this better. I was in a piece of software where there was no obvious visual indication of how to go back to where I was before. And yeah, it, it frustrated me because it often frustrates me because there are often situations where no, Apple's way of handling back on iOS is not always consistent. Sometimes it's a swipe back except when it isn't. Sometimes there's a thing up in the top left corner, except that's obviously a bad place to have it because most of the world is right-handed, meaning that most of the world holding their phone in their dominant hand has to reach all the way across it, all the way to the top in order to activate that or use a second hand. It seems to me that it should at least be an option to have back somewhere where you can actually reach it without reaching a second hand over to your phone. And I don't, I guess what I, what, what, what's challenging for me is I don't know why that bothers people. That I should think that that should be a choice. Um, I mean, it got zero replies and zero likes. Yeah, it's not the only, it's, it's the only reason that I'm bringing it up. It's not the only one that I've seen like this. And so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit because I'm not sure what to do. Should I not speak my mind then? No. Should I just let it go? Should I let go that Apple doesn't have a back button even though it's wrong? Should I let no. go that they don't have T9 dialing even though they could probably have a dev implemented in literally an afternoon? People are people are going to get annoyed. Um, I, th I think you remember like way back in the day when somebody sent me a, a death threat because I reviewed something negatively. Um, not that I ever thought it was like real. Um, yeah. I'm not uh, saying that. But like people are going to get really defensive about stuff. And if this individual person is hyper used to it, so due to their familiarity, yeah. disagrees, 
um, they might find a different way to try to explain that where they seem, I, I don't know, they might be using that feeling to justify this approach. Um, but you're a reviewer. I think you have to do that type of stuff. Um, and you're going to lose some people because of it. Sure. But that's fine. They can just go find a reviewer that feels more similarly to how they feel. Someone says iOS has T9 dialing. Are you sure? <clears throat> When did they add it? If that's true, you would just made him a happy man. Uh, n no, they don't seem to have it. Uh, you can get a third party app, like a third party oh, dialer. Yeah, it doesn't count. Yeah, that's no, no. So iOS does not have T9 dialing. Also, especially when you have gigantic borderline unlimited development teams like companies at this scale um, are able to have, I'm not necessarily saying they do, but are able to have, um, I think an option, even if quite buried, would be great. Um, I think the average user is not going to change defaults on practically anything, yep. especially if you don't like prompt them or let them know that it's there. So if you have some menu that's like... Uh, like navigation options or something. Right. And you you throw like uh, swiping from the side will always go back or whatever. Right. As an option in there. I think that's a easy solution that hurts no one. So why not do it? Yeah. I don't know. I, we, I went through something similar when I, um, I forget which car review it was, but I complained that it didn't have, uh, it didn't allow you to set cruise control under, I think about 50 kilometers an hour. And the use case that I brought up for that was school zones. And the number of people who were very angry at me for thinking that that was just an obviously good feature was kind of, it, it, it took me by surprise. Oh, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't like get it. like they were extremely angry because I should be paying attention in a school zone oh. and not in cruise control. Right? Like, like I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm actually not overselling how, how angry some people were about, about this. And I was kind of looking at it going, right, but if I set my cruise control at the right speed, right at the beginning of the school zone, then what I can do is I can not be watching my speed because I don't have to worry about on the road. A, a, a speed trap or anything like that. I can be at exactly the right speed. Not only that, but I can take my foot off my accelerator and I can cover my Up brake pedal. Brake. It makes a lot of sense it to me. It is objectively better. Yeah. And... And so is the problem the way that I am presenting it? Is the fact that I say it is objectively better, is that the problem? Maybe, but I still don't necessarily think you should change that. Because See, and, but people are still misunderstanding. I thought I I thought I explained it so clearly. Who watches their feet while driving? Nobody. Nobody's talking watching about that. Watching your feet. What are you talking about? I... So I don't think you should concern yourself with people that interpreted everything you just said as watching your feet. Okay. <laughs> that's. I think that's my argument. Uh, I think there's always going to be people that hear incorrectly. I think there's always going to be people that take a um, countering stance for whatever reason. I think you just got to ignore it and keep pushing forward. Um... But apparently my point is moronic. Speed should not be locked on in a school zone. Why not? It's also Do you not, not drive the speed. Limit? It's also not locked. If he brakes, yeah, I'm covering the brake. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm dialed in. It right? doesn't like keep it's... gassing while he's braking. Do you not know what cruise control does? Maybe, Maybe that's, that's a the misunderstanding. <laughs> We both, we both come to that conclusion at the same time. But yeah, maybe that's the problem. It's not it's not gonna the car isn't gonna keep trying to go at the same speed if he brakes. It's gonna let him stop. It's not gonna keep going. Yeah, no, there's no there's still people like really, really misunderstanding this. How gigantic is the school zone that you would engage cruise control? It's not about it's that. It's not about the length. It's about covering the brake. Yes. It's about those like fractions of a second of time that it takes to move your foot from the accelerator to the brake in an emergency situation. The likely it's it's not about the the speed limit. It's about the situation that you're in and the desire to have a higher level of awareness. Defensive driving. Exactly. It's not about whatever you guys are talking about. So when Phil Blanchett mentioned, it's not autopilot. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's just it's it, it's just setting a speed. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just. 
Okay, so so I think what we need to talk about then is how do I how do I present these things better, right? Someone in Philippine chat said, "LOL, Linus, you're letting yourself get trolled so hard. This is a problem. No. The whole I I hated when trolling and trolled entered the the lexicon of internet speech because it's such a scapegoat for such trash behavior." by so many people. The amount of people that I am 100% certain were totally serious and then figured out that they were just totally ridiculously wrong and then went, ah oh, ha ha, I be the trolling, is very high. It gets used for that. Yes, there is legitimate trolling. I have engaged in it. He engages in it daily, I am 100% certain. Um, and it can be very funny and like entertaining whatever when used in the right way, but like, I don't think this is that. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of um takes that without an utterly um unfamiliar type of logic uh just c could not possibly be conceived of as as a troll. They just are really 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 bad. Like the road's going right and they, they turn left, right? And as someone who's read, I promise you, a hundred times more YouTube comments than you have, right? I've seen everything. And you can, you, you, there's like a spectrum of likelihood that someone is trolling. And sometimes, no, it really isn't that. It actually is just not getting it at all. Um, like, why would it occur to someone to troll about something as sensible as, I would like to have my foot covering the brake while I'm in a school zone, just in case a kid runs in front of my car. Why, why would you troll about that? That's like, it's like trolling someone because they're like, yeah, this cup shouldn't have, it shouldn't let water through the bottom. Like what? No, it should. Like I, I it's not funny. So I, I, maybe that's, maybe that's it. I don't, I don't know. So then what do I, yeah, guilty logic. You're you're right. People think criticism of a product they use is criticism of them. But yeah. if I recall correctly, it was the review of the Chevy Volt. So I don't think a lot of people were using it. <laughs> oh man. Whatever. I'm Volt Gang. So someone said, and I don't know how true this is or anything, but Laddie says psychologically, breaking a little is perceived as more significant than lifting off the gas a little. The argument is that when driving through those situations, people tend to slow down a bit more, which is safer, but on cruise control, they won't break enough. They won't break because it doesn't feel enough to break for. What? Don't know. What does that even mean? I think they're saying that you are less, if you see something happening, you're less likely to break than to slow down. If you're unsure if the thing that, is happening is uh, uh, dangerous for you to be going your current speed at towards. Like if you see something moving behind a car, uh huh. I think they're saying that you're less and and you're like, oh, they could dart out to the street, or it could be a kid or whatever. You're. I think that they're well, saying you're a terrible, terrible driver. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, but I think that's what they're saying. So I've come to a complete stop because some kid was playing behind a car and I well, just yeah, didn't trust it. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I, uh, maybe, I, I don't know. Uh, anyway, there's a lot of people asking what the devil T9 dialing is. Uh, basically think about it like autocomplete while you're dialing a number. Okay. So except that normally if you're, you know, if you live somewhere and have acquaintances who live near you, you would all have kind of the same area code, right? So you might type in 604, and that's going to autocomplete 80% of the people in your address book, right? So that kind of autocomplete for dialing is not super useful. So I feel like the way most people probably dial these days is either through pre-programmed favorites, where you can just you know hold one of the buttons or whatever and dial them, using their voice control, or going into their contacts list, searching or scrolling, and calling someone from there. T9 dialing is amazing because what it lets you do, unfortunately, I can't really show you my screen because the numbers show up as part of the preview, is instead of dialing the number, you dial the letters. 
So you know how on your dial pad, there's little letters that correspond to every number? So if I wanted to call Luke, I just type 585 and swipe. It is fewer interactions. It's really, really fast. And it means that even if I have a ton of contacts, it's no more than three to four interactions right on the dial pad, and I can immediately call someone. That's why it's good. It takes away absolutely nothing from anyone else's preferred way to use it. And like I said before, and this is why it's so frustrating to me, it's like not allowing people to put icons anywhere they want on their desktop, right? It costs Apple nothing to implement it. Um, but they don't because why? I, I don't know. Oh, someone's saying call Luke is too hard. Well, A, that's, I mean, it's, who, what, you want to use voice control all the time? No. No, it's not always appropriate. And voice control is freaking terrible. I was going to say, I never use it because it tends to call the wrong person and that's really annoying. I, okay, you guys want to hear me go off on Google instead of Apple? This is fun. Watch this. Okay, here we go. Call Jake Tyvee. Sorry, who do you want to call? Look at this. <laughs> call Jake Tyvee. Calling Jake Tivy. Mobile. I said the exact same bloody thing both times. The first time it goes Jake TV. Now, the way it should work is Google should take that uh, should take that input, right? And it should go, hmm. Jake, I understood. Is there anything that could be kind of close? In this address book. To Tyvee. Mm -hmm. And it won't do it. I've got, I've got another really good one. This it one, feels like the... Um, this, yeah. It ahead. feels like the searching in Windows problem. Where when you search in Windows, if it's not 100% certain, it immediately just bings it. And it's like, mm, maybe you should have looked at local files. Yeah. Okay, this is a really good one. Call Hoffman. It's gonna be like hot man or something. Got a couple of choices. Which would you like? Got a bunch of uh, Google results it's for Ho Hoffman and Son Limited. Rob Hoffman, realtor. It's trying to Google Maps him somewhere. You wanna know why? Because Hoffman's name is spelled with two N's at the end. All you have to do <laughs> is check what's in my fucking address book <laughs> and find something kind of close. Do you know how often I try to call my wife <laughs> and I am not able to? You'd think it would contextually, you know, AI who I usually call and figure out who I'm talking about. So there's someone named Yvonne or some business called Yvonne something that if I just say call Yvonne, occasionally it'll dial. So if I don't pay attention, which is dangerous when I'm driving and stuff, right? If I don't pay attention to what number it says it's calling, it'll call this other random thing, probably one out of every 10 times but it gets even better. Okay, easy solution. Call Yvonne Ho, right? I'm sorry, there's no number for Yvonne Home. Uh... <laughs> there's one that's real close. So someone someone in chat said, yeah, it should, it should prioritize your local contacts. Yeah, yeah it's, of course like I said, it it's, it's the same. It's the same thing as the Windows search problem. Uh, it's the exact same issue. So this is the kind of stuff that I just, I, I don't know how to handle, right? Because other than getting angry about how obvious this problem is and how obvious the solution is and staying angry forever because it's still not fixed. Um, isn't it my job to... I think there's always going to be a certain know, minimum amount of alienation because uh, people are going to uh, misinterpret or disagree. And disagree is completely fine. Like someone might... <laughs> Someone might think that not prioritizing looking at local files on Windows and not prioritizing local contacts when trying to voice call someone is the right way. I'd be very interested in hearing that argument, but considering they both work that way, that argument's got to exist somewhere. I have no idea how it makes any sense, I but so. it's got to exist somewhere. And guys, so maybe they disagree. Adding nicknames like wife or d like changing people's names in your contact book to uh, no, that that's a bad solution. That's a stupid solution. That's yeah. a manual solution in an automated world. Like that's not how it should work. You can tell Google who your wife is and call say call my wife. Um no, that's <laughs> 
No. I respect your opinion, but I believe that Google, with their experience, could probably engineer a superior solution. And yes, I'm aware that you can say, call Yvonne Home Mobile. The problem is that sometimes it just doesn't. Sometimes it'll still do the home. It'll, it'll, it'll grab the word home first. The one that really makes me more angry than anything is when I'm dictating to the Google Assistant and it hears me just fine. It is exactly what I wanted. Call James Stribe. And then it's like, sorry, can't find James Strube or what? Because it, it just doesn't know that name. And it's like, no, no. Phonetically, you were fine. Everything was fine. And then you were like, Changed oh, you surely you thing. couldn't have meant that. Even though I have a contact in my contact list that matches what you had perfectly. You would think you would check, right? Because like fuzzy logic, right? You mm -hmm. would check the, 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 the 90 and then the 85 and then the 75% certainty If they prioritize local storage or in this case, local contacts. The second you say call as your prime first word, it should immediately prioritize local contacts. But yeah, I feel like I've said the same thing like a billion times, but the same as the Windows problem. It just... It, the Windows one is almost worse because even if you have a perfect match, it will first look online and then look local. So if you type it and then press enter quickly, it'll just Bing search it, which is so annoying. Yeah, that one bothers me. Um, but yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I don't know. I think you just got to keep doing it. And I think you would just keep doing it anyways. <laughs> so I don't think it matters. Yeah. An, in uninfamous Alex says, I believe it's in how the message is delivered. People will... Always expect you to come to them. So you stating that something is objectively better, even when it is, can come across as arrogant or otherwise. I, you know, I think that's fair. So That's probably fair, but I don't necessarily think you should change it. Well, you know, what, what is it? You catch more flies with honey than vinegar or whatever it is? So yeah. do I just have to like be nicer sometimes about it? Sometimes you don't want that fly to have honey. Sh should I just say, should I just say um, your, your stance that Apple should not build features that are better for some people is valid, but I respectfully wish that they would build features that are better for some people. Is it valid though? Um, I mean, it's valid to them. It's, no. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. I just People might, might not appreciate my stance on all that, but I just, I don't know. I think sometimes you lose people and I think sometimes it's worth it. Meet Ready to Yeet says, I'll play devil's advocate here. Having a name at all is a manual solution in an automated world. So adding wife in the relationship box is the same as putting a name in the name box. Uh, disagree. Actually, a lot of my contact list is automatic because I use Google for work. So Yeah, it gets populated by... Yeah, it just gets populated. Yeah. Um, and the more that we can automate, the better. So any excuses that we make for not automating things properly, I think is just... A setback right like why are we why do we accept it yeah yeah like if i email someone and they email me back i don't actually know at what point in that chain this happens but if there's email exchanges with someone they're added to my contacts and just it happens yeah and um, i want that that's good a cork 1947 says no f the haters accessibility and inclusiveness is something that every dev should strive for anyone who disagrees is wrong okay but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna win any friends that way no, but I agree. It's great. I need people to like me. Yeah. Or at least tolerate me. Sometimes, uh, as someone who works with developers on a platform, sometimes it is very technically expensive um, to incorporate those things. But we are currently talking about a platform that is at a scale where their technical powerhouse behind it is immense. And they could absolutely do these things. And it wouldn't be a big deal. Right. All right. What else we got to talk about today? Uh, oh, man. Do you want to talk about the Mario movie teaser trailer? I haven't even watched it. I if actually we, if haven't If we bring either. it up, we're immediately losing monetization. It's Nintendo. No, no, no. We're not going to... We don't have to show it. We can just all watch it together, guys. We'll just post the link in the chat. We'll do a bit of a timer. Yeah. And we'll just all press go. Here, let's watch it together. I, I haven't watched it yet either. Okay. So I'm throwing it in the Twitch chat. You got Floatplane chat? Yeah. I'm we're not going to have audio. Uh, aren't we? I mean, but we can't play it through the stream. Oh, we can just look at it. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. It's fine. 
All right, ready, set, go. Oh, good gravy! It's over two minutes long. Yeah. Uh oh man, I don't I don't know if I want to watch the whole two minutes. Okay, so there's some magma. What's the difference between lava and magma? I forget. One of them's underground. One of them's not. Cool. Thanks. So it's lava then. I think so. Well, lava is definitely the one above ground. I know that. Okay. 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 Big castle right next to the other castle. What's up, Magic Koopa? How you doing? It's kind of surprising they didn't do a Mario movie before, now that I think about it. They did. Did they? The Mario Brothers. It's like horrible. It's a live action. A movie? I thought they did. I know about the TV show. Oh, I didn't know it was a TV show. Maybe it's just a TV show. I don't know. Who is this? This isn't the... Oh. Hmm, penguins. Let's go. They're gonna lose. Yeah. And stuff. I can yep. kind of see this coming. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so it's going to be predictable, but that makes sense. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, I liked the little the little fur. Cute. They don't have realistic uh penguin teeth, but that's probably good. Because that's terrifying. Bowser kind of looks like an old man. And he breathes fire. He doesn't breathe fire like that. Yeah, he shoots fireballs, doesn't he? It was a movie. Apparently it was a movie. I'll show you what I know. Or there is a movie. I don't know. Maybe there's also a TV show. I don't wow, know. great lighting. I first noticed this with How to Train Your Dragon. Having cartoon characters in like two realistic looking fantasy environments yeah, is kind of jarring. It's a little weird. The, the, like the showing, third one. Showing the like kind of like the mushrooms look like they're plush. What the heck? They look like they're fabric. Okay. And that's it. All right. Official teaser trailer. I think the kids will like it. Bowser could breathe streams of fire in the OG Mario games and in 64. That doesn't sound right. In the OG Mario games, I thought it was fireballs. In the very first one, it's fireballs. I know that much. Yeah. And I don't think he throws any fire anything in Super Mario World for the SNES. I don't remember Super Mario Brothers 3, though. And he also said 64, and I didn't, I didn't play that. Oh, I can't hear anything, so I don't get to hear the voice. You must hear Chris Pratt play Chris Pratt. Uh... I don't think I need that. I'm sorry, guys. I don't need it. I'm good. But yeah, that's a thing. It happened. Chris Pratt's Mario voice is just Chris Pratt? Oh. That Riley seems... says it seems like he might be able be trying to do a slight New Yorker accent. Like, hey, I'm walking here. That seems like an oversight. Why didn't they just get the Mario guy to do the voice of Mario? Yeah, he's still alive. This has been weird the entire time. Oh. And I think it's probably really weird for him as well. Because, again, he's still alive. Yeah. Like, it's not like they couldn't get him to do it. Okay, our discussion question here is more than an hour of that voice might be a little much. Um, but is Chris Pratt's regular speaking voice too far in the other direction? <laughs> uh, probably, I would think. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, all right. In other news... Overwatch 2 had a pretty rough launch this week. Have you played? Have you tried to play? I guess this is a more valid question. I have tried to play. I have not played. Um, yeah, very funny. Very not surprising given that it's Blizzard and this is how every single game that they launch goes. Um, but yeah, Overwatch 2 launched October 4th, sort of. Players were stuck queuing with tens of thousands of other players. Blizzard president Mike Ybarra initially tweeted that they were experiencing server issues. He later tweeted that they were experiencing a massive DDoS attack. There are known bugs. Many of them. Some are very bad. There's a known bugs list. Um, there was a beta. I don't know why they bother sometimes if they're not going to do anything about the things that were found in the beta. There was four hours of downtime Thursday evening during prime time. That is specifically when I tried to play. <laughs> Hooray. Whoops. Very cool. Queues are apparently still really bad. 
Uh, even without the issue, some critics are still s upset at Overwatch 2 just in general. This has nothing to do with the launch problems. They're saying that it's basically Overwatch 1 with a couple of very minor feature updates, to be fair. They literally told you that. Um, like Wait, the doesn't ability... it not cost extra? No, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. And they said that the like the multiplayer is going to merge in and like you wouldn't have to pay for it uh, in order to play. Like I think you gain like single player stuff if you pay for it. It's one of those types of things. Which people were praising at the time and they got it and it wasn't different and now they're upset. I don't know. Um, there's not much of a graphical update. Uh, as far as I've heard, it's basically like it's six hours later. Like every map that is like sort of nighttimey is like kind of morning and every map that was nighttimey is like, or you know what I mean? It's just every map seems like it was pushed slightly further in the day. Um, the battle, it's a battle pass instead of loot boxes, which I mean, maybe that's better. Pick your poison, I guess. Maybe it's not. Um, the PVE mode got delayed. <laughs> I didn't know that. This is basically the, the only true new, new feature of Overwatch 2. As far as my understanding was back in the day, that's why they did it, uh, that they were mentioning. And now it's delayed like Halo's campaign co-op. Oh, I'm sure it feels very similar. The cosmetics and their pricing has been heavily criticized as per usual. Uh, there's a rare skin that costs three or a rare skin costs 300 coins, which will take over a month to acquire and legendaries cost 1900 so you're spending many months if you want to get a legendary okay is this me being out of touch why do you care just use a default skin yeah let's go i agree um i well i also don't want like ridiculous priced things for people that are going to buy it but yeah i, I just i wish people would default skin more often um and i think it's like ridiculous and stupid and should be frowned upon um when anyone criticizes anyone else for not having skins in video games because like wow that's the probably the least valuable purchase you can make in your day um other than okay actually that's very not true there's a lot of other things that could be worse but anyways it's not great uh there's a discussion question windows 11 was a free upgrade from windows 10 is blizzard doing the same with overwatch but worse, seeing as Overwatch 1 servers are shutting down, so you're required to upgrade if you want to keep playing the game. I don't think it's necessarily that much worse, because I don't think it's that different. The whole the, the whole argument of the game has barely changed means that I don't think you can really complain too much that Overwatch servers ended, Overwatch 1 servers ended. I do know that player teams went from 6 to 5, so if you had a friend group of 6 people that all played Overwatch, that sucks a lot. Um, I, I didn't see like that too particularly in any part of the notes, but I think that's going to be quite brutal. I think they went to five because basically every other game is five. So it'll make it easier for friend groups of five to transfer over to Overwatch. Um, that makes sense. And you can't really have, you can't really maintain the competitive balance at five or six. Yeah. But then if they didn't it's gonna be rough. make many changes to the maps anyway, then yeah, maybe it didn't. Then maybe it never mattered. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I I find the launch issues to be funny just because it's such a blizzard thing. Um every launch they're like, what? We got DDoS? Like every other time? No way. I mean, in like, fairness, that's probably a really big DDoS because oh, people it's probably really brutal. hate Blizzard. Yeah, with good reason. So Yeah. There's that. Yep. Okay. Yeah, playing games on launch, as fun as it sounds, uh, if you're not ready for this type of issue in the modern day, you just, it's going to happen with, like, basically everybody. It's pretty crazy. I do find it interesting um, that old school game launches went a lot better in a lot of cases because it was a lot more common for old school games to have dedicated servers. Yeah. So it, like, wasn't really much of an issue. So if there was a problem, people could just spin up another server and it would be some well, they're nobody like, spinning up the server so nobody would think to attack them they're like yeah yeah either your individual server gets ddos or if there's too many players i mean well your server just filled up and you as an individual if you're the server host you probably have reserve slot so you don't care yeah <laughs> no big deal yeah i don't know it's interesting Cano0403 in Floatplane Chat goes, how did I not notice the move from six to five players? I don't know. 
I yeah, I don't know. Or maybe it just didn't matter. <laughs> uh oh, in other news, I completely forgot to uh put this in the doc, but we did a review of the Starforge Systems Creator PC or I actually whatever. Did watch all whatever of this. that thing was called. And one of the And founders... your video isn't the number one. Yeah. Give well, I searched for... Oh, okay, okay, bonus. okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, one of the creators who is actually behind Starforge PC, uh, Asmongold, I think that's how I pronounced that, yep. did a reaction stream watching the review. Just, it appeared, uh, he's either an excellent actor or it appeared that he was doing it live, raw, hadn't seen it before. Um, and discussed sort of the criticisms that I had as well as the praises that I gave to the system. So it's funny to me that that actually has more views than the original review. <laughs> um, that's that's a little different. I, I think that's what he does sometimes. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's a thing that happened this week. I'd say that it is probably worth a watch. Um, I Have think you watched that, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've watched it. I think that I don't, I wouldn't have done it any differently from him. But he was very quick, very quick to declare victory when I said anything remotely positive. I think that makes it fun, though. It uh, is, and and what he's trying to do is make an engaging stream, right? So sure. like, so if if you if you say something positive, he's gonna try to cut you off before you potentially make it negative. Celebrate, and then if you trash on something, it it, it you know it makes the story more interesting. Sure, I mean, it makes sense. Um. And I think that, uh, but I will also say that he seems to be taking the criticism very seriously. So to to his credit, and I don't That's know good. much about the rest of the ownership group. In fact, I don't know much about him either. I, it's just not really a space that I participate in. Um, to his credit, and hopefully the rest of the ownership group, they seem to be taking the issues that we had very seriously. And you know, hopefully they're hopefully they're in this for the long run. I you know, still I still believe what I said at the end of that video. Um, there's there's risks associated with buying from any you know, brand new company that is still kind of trying to figure out what they're doing. Sometimes it can go very right. Sometimes it can go very wrong. So wish them, wish them the best of luck. Uh, I also stand behind everything I said about how challenging this business model is. It's really tough. It's really tough. There's, there's just not, there's not that much money in it. And there's costs that will be cumulative. There's costs that will pile up over time. As, as soon as you've got a hundred systems out there, someone is going to call support every day and that's not something you're making money on once you've got a thousand systems out there 10 someones are going to be calling every day and that's not something you're making money on and so these are just costs that all of a sudden you're kind of sitting here going well yeah that really wasn't part of our calculation when we were selling these things but uh, now we're just carrying these on an ongoing basis and i know that there's a lot of other boutiques that will that we'll that we'll talk to these people, and we did a we did a tech support. Hmm, has that, that video hasn't gone up yet. Okay, we shot a, another tech support stream, and you know the kinds of things people will call in about can be simple but very time consuming in some cases. You know, multiple reboots or you know reformatting something. And if you're trying to provide good customer service, you you can't just abandon them, right? And yeah. So it's 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 tough. It can be time consuming. It can be expensive. Um, I I wish them the most of luck. And my final word on the subject is that the logo is 100% a c in balls. There's simply no doubt. I mean, it even has, have you seen the logo? Oh, yeah. It, it even has like an asterisk kind of behind the balls, which is, you know, here, I'll, I'll mime it out for you what uh, that probably is. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Wow. So, I don't. Uh, I don't make the rules. Yeah. I, I don't decide what is or isn't a one of those. And it was obviously done with intention. But I do find the trying to play it off as if it wasn't entertaining, it which is, is it is. I am certain the whole point. But yeah. I mean, we can hope. Here, for those of you who are not familiar with what the logo looks like for Starforge Systems. 
Hammer? Really? Oh, totally. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's like Thor's hammer. So the, the handle's kind of, you know, proportionate to the size of the hand. And you've got the block down there. Uh-huh. And it's called Star Forge. So there's a star in the middle of the flat side of the yeah. hammer. Uh, yeah. 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 It's a yeah. penis rocket. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm glad we settled that <laughs> once and for all. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's next? Uh, we should do some merch messages. Yeah. What's up, Dan? Yeah. Are you typing away? Yeah, You're up. I'm typing away. Uh, let me just cancel this one. Uh, you can be responded to later. Yeah, we got quite a few here today. Uh, this one's from Nathan. Any chance of getting Floatplane app for Android TV and Video Shield? Uh, so far, those are the only ways I'm able to enjoy most long form content. Uh, sort of. And I kind of just want to leave it at that, to be completely honest. Um, Bottom. We have a bit of a plan for fixing some of those types of things, um, but I haven't actually really started working on it yet, so I don't want to talk about it too much because the second you talk about those types of things, people expect it's coming out next week. Um, And that's uh, definitely not how anything works. So, yeah. Is there a chance? Yes. Soon? Probably not. Uh, This is a good question from John S. Sorry, this one just came in, so Dan hasn't had a chance to curate it yet. But do you guys see big tech using peer-to-peer to to alleviate the cost of bandwidth in the future for higher quality video? It technically makes a lot of sense. But? But people don't want that. And there's an analytics issue. You yes. lose control over knowing exactly what is happening on your network on your network, uh, which is why the the what's it what's it called hub and spoke or whatever model is uh, remains dominant. There's a lot of reasons why when a lot of those types of yeah quality of service with that is hard. Yeah, there's there's a lot of very significant hurdles. Does it make a lot of sense bandwidth wise? Sure, absolutely. But it's been thought about for a very long time. And I think if it was genuinely the right thing to do, it would have been done. Okay. You want some more? Uh, last week, Luke mentioned how you built out a CDN for Floatplane. Usually I associate this with type of development with companies the size of Google and Cloudflare. How did a company your size go about it? Proprietary, don't talk to me anymore. With much difficulty. Very hard, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, We started running into, I I had some guidance from some people that used to work at Twitch. That's as far in as I'll go with that, um, about some things that we might run into. And uh, yeah, sure, we definitely ran into them. Um, And they they suggested at the time that we don't pursue doing that at all because of the issues that they ran into. And yep, uh, those are definitely issues that we ran into is all I'll really say. Uh, but our whole idea from the beginning was that we didn't want to be beholden to one thing. So we had to have a internally set up CDN that would at least technically work, work. so that we would always have a fallback. Was it the best? No. Could it even be, was it even the most cost effective? No. No. But it worked, and if we really have to, we can go back to it. Um, Right now, it's not so... We don't use it so much. Uh, We use it for some things, but not for everything. But honestly, the entire Floatplane project as a whole um, could have a giant question mark on it of how did you ever think you could do this with a team um, that isn't 10 to 100 times bigger? Uh, 10 would honestly be relatively small. Um, And it's... We've been trying really hard. (laughs) Uh, the team's really, really good. Uh, I strongly believe in each person on the team. Uh, I think they do a fantastic job. I think they are often harder on themselves than I am, uh, sometimes to the point where it's a problem. Um, but they try really, really hard all the time. I don't know. The, the effort is really high because you heard it here first. The float plane team is a bunch of tryhards. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, because I think the the personal care and investment from the members of the team is really high. Um, I mean, is it worth sort of explaining to people who don't fully understand what the difference is between just having a server and having a CDN? 
a lot of the problems behind CDNs, we talked about this earlier in the show, is ISPs. So if you plonk, and we ran into this like immediately, if you just plonk a server in Europe and you're like, we have a server in Europe, that's enough, right? All the Europeans can connect to that server. Yeah, it's close. That's great. It has a big fat pipe. It's not that far. Yeah. It's the internet. It's fast. It's fiber, you know, whatever. Yeah, well, except what if one of the people that is trying to access data off that server, also known as watch a video, is on an ISP and the route between that person all the way through their ISP onto whatever lines eventually lead them to your server. What if that route is junk? <laughs> What if somewhere in there is a problem and, uh, okay, so we're trying to set up our own CDN, but we don't have our own data centers because we're nowhere near that big and we have nowhere near that amount of money. So we're going to plunk into other people's. Well, what if that data center isn't super interested in fixing the problem? What if that ISP isn't super interested in fixing that problem? AG just mentioned congestion. There's tons of issues along the way and a lot of them are fairly out of our hands. Um, without doing immense amount of further investment. In some situations, even with immense amount of further uh, investment, without partnerships with these different ISPs, without uh, partnerships on a lot of different levels, it's really hard um, and basically only works at immense scale. Another big difference is that a CDN is going to have more than just origin servers. Right. So it's it's operating with a greater degree of complexity. You are intelligently caching the content that people are most likely to need as close to them as possible uh, while keeping the main repository of your content in a consolidated central or location or locations. So it's more complex, essentially. There's a big problem. Yeah. So one of the, one of the early projects that we made um, was like a multi CDN system so that we can switch which one we use. Uh, because one of the very important parts from the beginning was that we wanted to be able to, you know, maybe we have some downtime if this has to happen, but there's a path every time. If if someone cuts us off for whatever reason, there's a path. We know what we have to do. If our CDN cuts us off, we know what we have to do to get going again. If our server host cuts us off, we know what we have to do to get going again. There might be complications there. Um but I think that's fairly reasonable and it's never actually been a problem, which is great. It's very cool. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Let's see. Got another one from Adam here. Hi, Linus and Luke. Linus, from your experience at NCAX, do you have any advice for someone early in their career as a spend category manager, specifically for someone working in the electronics slash electromechanical space? I don't know. Don't f up. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> don't order too much. Don't order too little. If you order too much or too little, uh, cover your butt. <laughs> I don't know. Like, right? It's just, it's your typical, like, corporate desk job politicking, right? Like, it's, uh, if you're, if you're decent, right? If you're, if you're pretty good at what you do, then... Yeah, it shouldn't be a it shouldn't be a major problem to get the hang of w whatever it is that you're that you're buying and buying the right amount of stuff. Uh, be organized, you know. That's something that I wasn't always good at, but it was something that I strove to do. I think that's the best I can really offer you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, this one's from Daniel. Love the show and all you guys do with labs rolling out. How do you think you guys will move away from using direct links to products in video descriptions and instead link to labs pages that show up to date recommendations for that type of product? I think that is a good idea. I didn't think of it personally yet, um, but I think it's a it's a most wonderful, yeah. super extra good idea. So like links yeah, to cool. labs and then labs to the actual products? Yeah. With that said, I know that YouTube is working on more features where you can shop directly on the video like from within the video player and so it might not always make sense to link back to a labs page that could end up being an overwhelming information dump on people so depending on the product yeah it might not be the most sensible thing like if we do a roundup and we're like this is the best one that's all the information you might need at that point so maybe we just link to that product and it's and, and it's all done with hard to say but that's a good idea 
Okay, got another one here from Alan. Uh, what do you think about having VR headsets that offload as much as the weight of possible to hang around the neck uh, and on the shoulder, like some Bluetooth headsets? Uh, uh, P.S. RC fire truck merch when? <laughs> okay, well, no promises for any what, fire. Oh, dang it, Dan! <laughs> no promises for any fire truck merch. Uh, I think that that would really restrict the mobility yeah, of your I think head. There's, I think there's a lot of issues with that actually. Uh, also, I think they would move more. Yeah, I could see that. They'd have a higher higher potential to slide around and move more. I think we just need them to get lighter, plain and simple. I don't think there's any way around it, guys. Okay, uh, this is from an anonymous. What we've got a, Sorry, we've got a bit of a... Dan's really far away, so there's a bit of a line delay. Um, you know, when we're talking, it's kind of like on the news. You know, when the one person finishes talking and the oh, other yeah, person's Linus, like... absolutely, yeah. Thanks, Dan. It's been great having you on the show. Uh... <laughs> okay, sorry. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, it's nice to be here. <laughs> okay, this one's from Anonymous. Uh, what, what are you most afraid of in the coming decade? Nuclear war? <laughs> no, 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 no. Not, uh, not like three months, like decade. <laughs> nuclear Bye. fallout nuclear winter other more different nuclear war um <laughs> my children's generation um having no idea what to do with themselves in a world that is full of automation it's gonna be really difficult i know there's this whole thing where like oh the older generations always look down at the younger generations and think they're weak or whatever i'm looking down and being like you guys are gonna have a hard time like yikes <laughs> yeah yeah it feels like we're trending in the other direction so yeah okay this is an interesting one this is by peter uh hi ellen l i wonder how differently lmg and mkbhd operate lmg with 80 plus workers and multiple sponsored videos a day mkbhd with a small team irregular videos and hardly uh, hardly ads uh why the difference Okay, well, there's a couple things. Uh, first of all, we do not have multiple sponsored videos a day. Boy, would that ever be profitable. Oh, I think I see what you mean. Okay, so I was drawing a distinction between a fully sponsored video and a video with a sponsor, like, message in it. Uh, so, yeah, I guess yeah, I guess we have multiple videos a day. Uh, Marquez has a relatively small team. Not as small as it used to be. Like, whew, boys hiring. They're hiring over there, you guys. Um, but, yes... Uh, a much more irregular schedule, um, fewer fewer sponsorships. I mean, they're just they're just different models, right? Like the Mark Rober model, right, is very different from either of us. Every single video, that dude is swinging for the fences. Like if he doesn't get 30, 40, 50 million views, I suspect his sponsors and partners are going to be are going to feel shortchanged. You know what I mean? Whereas we're built more along the lines of like, hey, we are going to up we upload, you can't set your you can't set your watch to LTT, but you can certainly set your calendar. We upload every day on a schedule. There's no shortage of ideas. If anything, we don't have enough time to make all the videos that we want to make. So you can count on us to have videos coming. You can count on the quality to be consistent. But you know what? Whether it's due to the sheer volume or whether it's due to the more niche nature of our subject matter, it's not going to get 30, 40, 50 million views. You'll expect somewhere in the neighborhood of one to four million views, something along those lines. And you can adjust your expectations accordingly. By the way, because we know what our inventory is going to be a year in advance, uh, you can uh, set up a retainer and you can kind of schedule out what you're going to want your quarterly spend to be, coordinate that with your launches and whatever else it is that you need to do. And, and that's the way that we kind of roll it. As for Marquez, I mean, I don't have any insider information into how they're structured. Um, obviously, we sponsored a video with them recently, and the process was really not that dissimilar to what it's like for a sponsor to sponsor a video with us. So I think they're just, you know, maybe not swinging for the fences like a Mark Rober. It's still a more niche kind of subject than what, what Mark does. But I think that Marquez does tend to 
stay a little more on the mainstream side of tech. And I think that, um, you know, they're just, they're doing what works for them, right? I don't know. I, I, not everyone aspires to do what we're doing here, even if they could. There's advantages and there's disadvantages to doing things different ways. Like, I think the grass is always greener on the other side. At Creator Summit, I ran into a lot of, you know, one person bands, um, you know, and I, I would look at them kind of enviously sometimes, right? Like, here they are. They don't, no one's calling them. <laughs> you know, there's no one's asking them for direction. Um, they're, 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 their monthly overhead is basically nothing. If they decide to take two weeks off, they just are not working for two weeks and there's no, there's no cost associated with that other than an opportunity cost. Um, but then, you know, they look at me and they go, wait, you posted a video five minutes ago. We were talking five minutes ago. I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, we've got like the team still in the office. They're doing that, you know, and that to them is like pff, mind blowing, right? Like, wow, that would be amazing. But something I learned very early on is that the worst way to double your output is to hire twice as many people. It just does not work like that. There's just something inherent about building out a business that adds bloat and adds inefficiencies and adds communication problems, especially HR issues, scale. especially as you scale. And every time you kind of reach a new milestone of growth, uh, these, these problems compound, right? Like there are, I've had so many conversations that I would never in a thousand years have expected myself to have. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into any of them right now because I think people will know, you'll know who you are. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's very challenging. There's no, it's kind of the beauty of YouTube. I know I've talked a lot of negativity about YouTube over the years, but you can kind of do it any way you want. The only thing that matters is the result that you are creating content that people want to watch. And I think that we have a very different audience from someone like a Marquez. I think we have a smaller audience that is accustomed to tuning in daily. Whereas I think he has a broader audience that may or may not tune into every single video. And you can see that in the variations in viewership from, from one video to the next. Um, and either way works, right? Like seems, he seems to be doing all right. I'm definitely doing all right. Yeah. That's your cue, Dan. I thought you were doing the camera. Well, we don't I'm really using the, the camera as the cue. Okay, whatever then. Uh, this one's from uh, Anonymous. Uh, I work as a, an engineer full-time and have thought of starting a side gig and slowly transitioning into that full-time if it is fruitful. What practical gotchas would you keep an eye out for? Uh, what would uh, indicate the side gig is mature enough for a full-time transition? Money. Money, yeah. Is it enough money to support yourself? It doesn't have to be the same amount of money you're making now, but you have to look for that trend line. Is it heading toward where, what you're making now? Will what you're making now scale more and move out of reach? Does it make you happier, right? Does it give you more time at home with your family, for example? Um, and most importantly, is it enough to support yourself? I would add in proof of concept first. Don't try to whatever it is that you're doing don't try to make the final thing first and then after having done all of that investment see if it's viable that's a really good point you should do something just something anything just to find out if maybe you're the kind of person who just you might not even want to do get it. motivated yep like if if you don't have an office to go to and people to talk to yep. you know what i mean like maybe you just won't feel like getting out of bed even though there might be some waste involved it is worth putting your toe in the water first instead of just diving in. Yeah. Okay, got another one here from Eli. Hey guys, first time merch buyer here. With DLSS3 technology on the horizon, what do you think that AI enhanced technology could take gaming in terms of performance, visuals, etc.? I think it would be really interesting to see uh, like procedurally generated assets in a game through AI. Like, you know how I talked about before the idea of game development where you just 
make a brown cube and then say this is wood yeah and all of a sudden you've got like a like a like a, cr- a, wood a wooden crate box or, yeah. you know right yeah. or something like that um yeah you could add more to it you could say like wooden chest yeah yeah i i think it would be really interesting because you know one of the things that's really immersion breaking for me in particular and to be clear i'm not I'm not saying that this is a big problem and I am so bothered by it, but but it, it does break the immersion for me when I notice duplicated assets. Yeah. If I walk into a grand ballroom and I notice that every single candle is exactly the same asset, it, it can be a little immersion breaking. Dungeons and video games are, are a classic version of this. Yeah, like, oh, they made four models for stone bricks. Like every, every Skyrim, or not every Skyrim dungeon, but like a huge portion of Skyrim dungeons are the same path but different like textures and stuff yeah so i think it would be super cool if instead of actually building out the individual models uh there was a game developer or game developers or an engine developer that made ai a a, an integral part of the of the game itself so when you when i say procedurally generated i don't mean like the layout of a dungeon i mean the look of it yeah so so you the developer it, like, damp or, or yeah the yeah, developer would yeah. say it's it's damp it transitions this way it's it's uh it's gloomy it's granite it's it's this it's that and and you would you would just kind of you could go into each one i, I think it would be cool because you could make like enormous enormous games and i really do i really do enjoy games that have uh like a a, a sense of a vastness, a sense of scale and exploration. I think that's something that is going to continue to work better as we get technologies like direct storage in our games, uh, you know, on PCs and stuff like that. Um, you know, being able to seamlessly roam from one environment to the next with no loading times and just, you know, go out in front of a, a verdant field. I think it might be, it could be kind of cool. Yeah, like if every rock in a field was a bit different you know so that i think that deduplication of assets would be would be super cool yeah there that's one that's one idea has anyone done that like guys let me know there's been forms of it you could do it through procedural textures yeah but i think that i think that ai could probably do it better like if you really just put down white spheres and we're like these are all skulls I think it could be done. Like high resolution skull models. Totally. Should be. Like with current technology, I think it'll just it would take a while for that to become mainstreamable. Yeah. People keep on saying no man's sky. I don't think it's quite that. No, 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 no. I think what you're talking about is like asset mutation almost. Like a developer yeah. would do yeah. one skull. And then you would say this skull is longer and it has more teeth, or it could just modify it in different ways. You're right? talking about like the, the input the, stuff that's happening to research. Exactly, AIs. but you only have to do one, um, which would be kind of interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay. Moving on. Um, hi, Linus and Luke. Been watching since the NCIAC days. Uh, what non AAA hidden gem gem game that you would recommend everybody play or at least try? It's hard to recommend games to everyone. Yeah. Uh, I feel like especially these days, to be completely honest, um, unless it's like a Mario platformer, it's, you know, usually they're a little bit more specific. One of the ones that I, I enjoy throwing out there is Golf Story. I've done it a bunch of times, though. It's very fun. Uh, if you are not interested in golf games, it will still be fun. It's not exactly a hidden gem game, but I'm really enjoying Battle Block Theater with my son. That's cool. Yeah, it's fun. Nice. <laughs> uh, Minecraft? <laughs> Risk is good. Man, this is going to be one of those things that doesn't age well, but I don't know that anything will ever go x86 mainstream. Yeah, this is asking about uh, if Risk Five is ever going to go mainstream. It could go mainstream. Oh, Dan was muted. Sorry, guys. Uh, the question is. Um, how long do you think it will take Risk Five hardware to go x86 level mainstream? I don't know that it will. I think it will go mainstream. I think there being other things that exist 
will yeah. limit it from being able to go to the same level of mainstream. But in a different way, I, yeah. I could see Risk Five being more of a competitor to ARM. Like we could see Risk Five, uh, you know, dominate low cost IoT devices. We could see Risk Five move into the data center. Um, I don't know that ARM is going to make it in. Well, I mean, I, Apple's making it work, but like it's, it's still niche. I don't want to say never, but given how long it's taken ARM, <laughs> right? And we could we could we could think that maybe the life cycle would happen faster, but I, I you know I think we're we're a long way away. Hey, Linus and Luke, what piece of media or technology from your childhood? Were you nostalgic for until you went back to it and realized it sucked? Pilot Wings is not as good a game as I thought. It's good. It's very basic. There's, I think it's not that things were sucked, but they were definitely they depth. more basic than I realized. Like, I was, turns out, pretty easy to amuse as a kid. I think the scale for things has changed a lot. Like you can even see that with movies. Yeah. Like an explosion that was like huge and crazy back in the day yeah. is like nothing compared to what they're throwing in modern Marvel stuff. Um, I don't know. I feel like I've been pretty realistic with things. Like even with Morrowind. Mor I was going to say Morrowind. <laughs> <laughs> even with Morrowind, I've told people to not go back and play it. Yeah. Because like. But did you ever have a moment when you went back and realized it sucked? No. No, okay, so I you did, always knew it sucked? I did go back, yeah. I would go back to it and be like, yep, these are all the reasons why this game aged really poorly. Um, and it's just like, I still love it because I played it back then, but I think it's really hard for people to get into now because it has a lot of these uh, these uh, rough points. Uh, Battle Block Theater was the title of the game I was talking about. No, I think everything that I enjoyed as a kid is exactly as awesome as I thought it was. Even the album Aquarium by Aqua. Yep. I've, um, um, I mean, slash that, S. That is just S. a good album. It is a good album. It's though. Fantastic. I will support you on that. It's actually yeah. an excellent album. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Moving on from Eden. Uh, thank you for the quality content. Have you ever thought on trying to somehow get your hands on an AWS's Graviton processor? I think it'd be interesting to see what the cloud vendor's custom processor has to offer. The thing is that unless we went out and wrote software for it, yeah. we wouldn't be able to do anything with it. Like, yeah, it would definitely be cool to just like take apart a Graviton server. But that would be that would be kind of it. We wouldn't be able to talk about much more than the hardware and why it's really cool and interesting that Amazon is building their own hardware. Yeah, I don't know. Want to build thing. float plane for Graviton? Like, no. Yeah, me neither. Okay, from anonymous. Starting from the tiny production that you did, would you say that there was a point where you looked around and it felt like things were going to be okay? I still was... don't know if things are going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, was there an increase in daily happiness, comfort that came no. with the stability? It sounds like you've just been sad for years well, now. Well, not yeah. sad, but stressed, yeah. I don't um, think that stopped. There, the, 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 the more stability we have at the base of this organization, the more things we continue to pile on top of it, right? And then, you know, if we think of it like, uh, you know, if we think pyramid, like uh, like a corporate structure, right at the top of that pile, swaying in the slightest breeze is me. <laughs> <laughs> if anything goes catastrophically wrong, you know, it all comes tumbling down. Probably not. But the stability is constantly increasing. But that doesn't stop me from, you know, seeing a day of, of viewership being down or or store sales being down and going, this could be it. This could be the death spiral. I feel like I feel like pretty much any business leader is going to feel that way um, because that type of thinking is probably what got you to where you are. Um, but there, there, I, there is objectively very significantly more stability these days than there was. At the beginning? I don't know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, this one's more of a demand than a question. Uh, from Oliver, pick an upcoming tech you are both <laughs> most excited for. We both have to be excited for it? I think it's individual, but we will... Let's make it, it has to be one you we're both collaborate. excited for. Yeah. yeah. AR? 
I mean, yeah, but that's such an easy answer because we both have the memory of a sieve. Yes. So I just need it to it's tell me who I'm talking to. highly important for both of us. Yeah, like what their birthday <laughs> is, what their interests are. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, more RGB. I, no. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, better electric cars. I think cars. I'm kind of over it. RGB? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to lie. I think I'm kind of done. I don't know. The land room that we set up recently, it was pretty it was it cool. It is pretty cool. Yeah. Like the kids like it. Like I set up RGB strips um, along the outside of the girls' bunk bed on each level. So instead of having like a reading uh, light. Instead of like a night light. And yeah. Stuff they too. just have an RGB strip that shines out against the wall. And like they love it. It was fun to set that up for them. That's cool. I don't know. Like it's it's one of those things where it totally has its uses. For sure. But it can definitely be overdone. Yeah. You're both excited about more RGB? I think we dodged the question. We can move on. I, well, I okay. think AR realistically. Yeah, but, but I do agree yeah. that it's a bit it's a bit easy for us because we both, yeah, for the same reason. Sure. Uh, this is from Cosmo. Hey, Linus. Uh, you mentioned that you won't review the Pimax VR headset because it doesn't fit you. I'm wondering if you would consider giving it to another member of your team to review. I have a Pimax 5K and I'm absolutely loving it and want more people to know about it. Um. Yeah, I mean, I guess nothing would prevent anyone else from reviewing a VR headset. I have been the one who has done our VR reviews in the past, so no one else really has any experience reviewing a VR headset. You need a lot of context to review VR devices. Um, I don't know. I could just take another crack at it. Maybe just suck it up, princess, and wear it. It's fine. Uh, it's, yeah, it was fine other than being horribly uncomfortable. Sounds like for me, for my kingly nose here. Grand, deluxe, <laughs> deluxe size. Special edition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, review's done. Uh, we've got one from Quinton. For Linus, what technologies, if any, do you use as parenting tools? Life, um, Life 360, network level, parental controls, that yeah, sort of thing? Yeah, I use Google's Family Link. And then I use Microsoft's vastly inferior Windows parental controls. Mostly our systems in the house are unlocked and the kids can use them. They're pretty good kids. We haven't really had any problems with that yet. I think that's about it. Okay, I got one here from Adam. What's the coolest concept you've tried and failed to figure out how to make into a video? Oh. I mean, man, I've wanted to do a redux of like whole room water cooling for a long time and it just has not materialized. Uh, I'm actually bringing up the, the the doc right now, the ideas doc. Yeah. I'm sure I can find some stuff. I wonder if that's one of the like oldest still consistently used Google docs. I think so, yeah. yeah. Of like anyone. Because that's like very, very early Google Docs and it's still being used. Uh, the longest cable conversion is one that I want to do. Like convert a signal as many times as you can. Oh. So you start with like a display port port <laughs> on a computer and then you go to like HDMI and you convert that to VGA and you convert that to like composite, convert that to component, convert it back to HDMI, convert it Try back to, to display all the way port back and up. then like plug, yeah. plug into a monitor. It's just, it's like utterly pointless. Yeah. You know, it's just, because we can. It sounds fun, but... Yeah, yeah, but, like, does anyone really need to know? Um, oh, yeah, this is kind of a cool one. Just, like, owning an EV kind of sucks, and it was inspired by some difficulties that Brandon had had with Tesla, that my in-laws had had with Tesla, that some of the other EV owners here had had with their electric cars, and just sort of talking about the challenges. I think everyone talks about how amazing it is, but there are downsides. Uh, I don't know. There's uh, There's so much stuff in here, man. It's like, it's literally hundreds and hundreds of line items. Uh, I had the idea of a series called, I can't believe they made this. And it was just going to be just like wild stuff. And there's, there's a few kind of ideas that are in here for this. I, oh, Sounds like kick I want to do a replacement on a, of like a motherboard socket show oh. you know, why it costs a hundred dollars, even with all the appropriate tools. If you bend the pins in your motherboard socket, like to, to get it replaced, there's, there's just so much stuff in there. Okay, from Eric. Given how far LMG has come and all the milestones you didn't think it would reach, has it made you predict and plan for the future in new ways? Um, I don't actually, for all my doomsday 
prophesying. Uh, I don't actually think it's just going to disappear tomorrow anymore. So I do plan for the future. That's a big difference. Like I think in the early days, I was afraid to make multi-year investments because I didn't believe that the company would necessarily still be there. Uh, I think I I think I put on a brave face, but I think I, we, we knew. probably knew. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs> um, Remember that job offer I got from I think uh, Western Digital, like shortly after we started up, and I was like, "Hmm, <laughs> this might have been a good thing to just take." I'm glad I didn't. This worked out great. Yeah, but it was not a guarantee at that point in time. Yeah, at least now you're not naming drive colors. But um, I still remember when, and we're still using it. I, I I'm not going to name the service, but there's a service that I bought a bunch of credit for because it was on like some crazy like word where our company exists now and I was confident they were going to exist due to the people that were behind it and I bunch of bought a bunch of credit in it for float plane and we're still riding on that credit because it was such a ridiculous discount oh seriously um and I was so confident that we were going to like exist for a long time and I remember thinking that and being like this is different <laughs> especially because float planes chances were a lot lower than oh, yeah. lmg yeah. at that time the discount was crazy though right i've okay. told you about this like way in the yeah. past yeah i just don't want to go into specifics okay Here's oh this one. is cool oh yeah no go ahead oh uh, yeah uh luke i still got my I word 97 this. you yeah. signed for me at pax east years ago yes my question what's the weirdest slash coolest thing either one of you have signed for a fan uh, P.S. Beyond excited for labs and future engineering content. I've had people have me sign body parts. Yeah. But not like the ones you'd think. Oh. Like, you know, very few people ask tech bros to sign their breasts, for example. You know, like like your stereotypical. I have. You, uh, okay. Well, that's, that's the difference between us, I guess. <laughs> Prosthetic <Lab> Chad. <laughs> um, yeah, I'd say... I. <laughs> I sign on a fair number of sandals. Surprising number of sandals. That's interesting. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There's been a lot of like, like cool things. Like people would bring in like apart from their computer. I've always thought the GPU backplate was pretty sweet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, people would just bring in the backplate and they'd collect some signatures on it. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the the word ninety seven. Like I. I Literally the second I read, I've still got my Word 97. I knew exactly who it was when it was from everything because that was pretty cool. Um, I like stuff like that, but yeah. Oh, this one's terrifying. Uh, Daryl, what do you think of Google Matter, the new Google Home connection standard? I hope it succeeds as a single unified standard. I have my dumps. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't even make it to the end of this year. I don't know. Six Look months, up uh, XKCD's years. standards comic. Yeah. No, for real though, this may not be that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. It, All right. It might, it might be good. Hmm. Okay. And last one here is from uh, Alejandro. With EA confirming plans to create intrusive anti-treat root kits akin to Riot's Valorant, uh, what are your thoughts on companies expanding root kit development and potentially testing gaming performance? seems like a really good time to start getting into the idea of partitions for gaming. Oh, oh, interesting. Yeah. VMs create a lot of issues. Um, yeah, they do. Especially with things like cheat detection. Um, so yeah, partitions for gaming. Get that boot speed down and start switching. I like it. We've actually got like 11 incoming merch messages. So maybe I'll blitz through these real quick. Yeah, have a look, see if any of those are interesting to you. There's actually one I think I'll read out here. Uh, with the labs creating custom software and even hardware for testing, is there any plans to make those tools public or open source? We've actually got a video coming about this uh, very soon. We're going to be showing off our uh, our benchmarking tool named Mark. Oh. Mark Bench. That's pretty great. Mark Bench, the benchmark. And it's an automated tool for benchmarking games. We're also going to add compatibility for productivity tools. And right now, it's fairly rudimentary. It just is kind of just an automation tool with us with a simple GUI that logs the data, 
uh, logs data like frame times, um, thermals, power consumption, that sort of thing. But over time, we do want to make it significantly more robust. And I would like to make it available to the community for personal use. And maybe we have commercial licensing available for other outlets. I don't know what that would look like. There's a lot of questions to be answered. But yes, it is my desire to make it broadly available. There's a lot of confusion about my partitions comment. Uh, I did not foresee this, but there is. I don't mean like installing your games on another partition. Uh, I mean booting into like another operating system. Uh, like have if you if you just use Windows, have another one installed. Um, is what I'm saying. The only motorcycle I've ever owned is an SV650S Levi. It's a 2003, and my dream motorcycle is that one painted pink. To be clear, I mean an additional windows so you, you could have if you're a windows 11 uh, person you could have two windows 11s one installed on another drive or partition is another way that i should have said it so you could have two boot drives or you could have uh two boot partitions and you separate things you separate uh all your personal stuff all your important things etc and then games uh we do seem to be trending in that direction and i, and I actually do genuinely think that's going to be a, a decently good way to do it okay Uh, well, the problem is um, I still don't actually know if they time out. Will they show if we click show, Luke? If they time out? Yeah, because you know they have the 180 second timer or whatever. Uh, what? Then, then they would go into the queue, so they would show, yeah. They would show. If, so it if works? they're in the queue, yeah. Okay, yeah. so you can put them in the queue after they time out. That's fine. What's the purpose of the time out anymore then? Uh, you know the timer, right? The 180 second timer when they start coming? I think it's supposed to automatically show if that happens. Well, that doesn't seem good because then stuff could slip through. They will. Conrad says they will. Okay. It should be in the doc. It should be in the doc about the, about the messages. Dirtface Larry. No, I did not see uh, Hoobie's Garage's video about toying with the F-150 Lightning. I saw that it existed. I didn't actually watch the video, but it's a really good question. Uh, can EVs overcome their dependence on aerodynamics or get higher efficiency batteries to compensate? Um, so there's a whole thing, right, about the with the energy density like of, of hydrocarbons like gasoline, right? It's really, 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 really high. Like it's actually amazing how much energy is stored in those bonds such that we can so inefficiently extract it by literally just burning it. And it, 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 we're still able to accomplish so much with so little. I don't know that EV batteries will ever be able to achieve that kind of power to weight ratio. And it may always be a challenge. Um, with that said, I think that for a lot of people, what they do with something like a pickup truck can probably be handled by an EV pickup. And for those who need to actually haul a lot, there will be larger commercial vehicles that will be designed for that, like Tesla Semi, which hopefully is really good, but um, you know, who knows, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I have my doubts. It's possible that we will be reliant on fossil fuels for quite a long time. I just hope that we can reduce our use of them as much as possible. Um, okay. Uh, uh, sorry, Matthew S. No, we haven't really thought about working with a local high school on the video or tech side. I don't know what we would do with them exactly. Uh, well, I mean, there was that time that we talked to my kid's school about like upgrading their computer lab and they were basically like, yeah, they have to be Macs. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really have any hookups for that. Yeah. So I guess you guys can just keep whatever you have now. <laughs> so that was something. <laughs> um, Are they all Macs right now? Uh, it's a, yeah, that was a different school that yeah. uh, my son was at before. Uh, David Andre asks, what does LTD do to cover the energy usage of all the equipment that you use? Carbon credits, solar power for HQ and lab? Curious after your home solar videos. Um, nothing. I mean, carbon credits are like pretty debatable whether they are actually helpful. What even are they? Uh, basically, you just buy like uh, 
an ease, like an, uh, uh, um, a feel better thing. Yeah, pretty much. So if you pollute, you like buy feeling better by giving money to companies that are working on like green initiatives or something like that. Okay. Um, yeah, we're all hydropower here, though. Yeah, it's BC's... honestly something that I sleep pretty well knowing. Yeah. To be clear, hydropower is not perfect. It has other issues, but once the dam is there, the milk <laughs> is sort of spilled <laughs> to a degree. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, let's just get through these last few. Brandon R. says, peace and love, guys. You mentioned a music producer, PC Wild. Oh, good gravy. Uh, y yes, we will do it eventually. I'm so sorry. Uh, Sam H. Collabs take a long time. I got a new desk and was wondering when the cable management things would be out. Uh, sometime next year. And Frankie F. Do you plan on hiring anyone interested in the USA? Uh, or expanding to the USA. No, I don't have any plans of expanding to the USA. As a not American, expanding to the USA is a non-trivial task. We'd have to like incorporate in America and there's all kinds of legal implications with all of that and I don't want to. Anonymous, bit off topic. Uh, what are the, hmm, what are the items, maybe tech, that you must have in your car. I'm new to driving and want to be prepared. What are your must haves? Got your emergency blankets. Got your first aid kit. Got your tire pump. Um, I've got a, a lighter to uh, 120 volt and USB adapter inverter doodad. Um, I like, oh, go for it. I hoard napkins. Always have a napkin hoard and uh, some ketchup in my glove box. Um, in BC, I think it's a decent idea to have those like strap on cleat things for your mm -hmm. shoes. Um, they're, they're not very expensive and you can just throw them in your trunk and forget about them until you need them and they'll be fine. Um, some amount of, of uh, stable food and water it might not be for you. Like that's something to think about with mm -hmm. all of this stuff is it might not be for you. Um, yeah, those jumper battery banks. I have one of those in the van. I don't have one in the Volt. Uh, flashlights, yeah, sunglasses, lots of good suggestions. Tons of this stuff is you don't, you don't, it, even if you're like, oh, I just like drive to work and back, like this is never going to be applicable. Again, it might not be for you. Maybe uh, you need to help someone find their dog. So having a flashlight so you can look around would be cool. I don't know. It's just things that would be uh, nice and helpful to have. Crampons. Is that what it's called? I don't know. Finally, Travis asks, what are your favorite games to play with your SO? Um, Vaughn and I picked up Overcooked again recently. It's been pretty fun. Whatever she wants to play is really what I'll take. Yeah. <laughs> I'll yeah. accept that. Yeah. All right. I think that's it for the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Oh, right. Don't do the thing. Okay. okay. You can, I mean, you can do it, but not through there. Just do it through here. I don't, I don't know how to press, do that. Press. I already pushed it. Oh, it's not doing it. It's not doing it. Uh, do you have the server running? Do I push it again? Let's make yeah, sure it's working. the server's working properly. Uh-oh. I think this is... Did you uh, set it up before the show? I think so. There we go. And the button... <laughs> Hey, hey, look at that. Hey. hey. Uh, are you turning this off? I might like it. Oh, is it still live? Oh, jeez. Oh, jeez.